Okay, let's try something together. Open any world map you have available. It can be the one you find in your bookcase or even an online version. Take a look at the vast area covered by water. That's 71% of the Earth's surface. And all that is salt water from the world's oceans. There aren't any borders between the four oceans we've all come to know. But oceanographers and the world's countries did traditionally split these waters into four distinct regions. The Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic Oceans. And here comes the big surprise. The scientific community has recently recognized the fifth body of water. It's called the Southern Ocean, and three of the four original oceans border it. It circumnavigates Antarctica and the lower portion of the globe and reaches Australia and the southern portions of Africa and South America. What makes this ocean so special? How did the scientific community eventually recognize it? And more importantly, what mysterious creatures does it hide? <laughs> Let's find out! The Antarctic Ocean, or the Southern Ocean, was first mentioned back in 1937 in the second edition of the International Hydrographic Organization's Limits of Oceans and Seas. That's a mouthful. Back then, this organization considered that it was wrong to consider the Antarctic Ocean as its own distinct body of water. Why? Well, because at that time, an ocean was defined as water surrounded by land and not water surrounding land. However, they reconsidered it in 2000 and voted to include this ocean in the official list. They also decided on the name Southern Ocean over the commonly used Antarctic Ocean. Finally, the organization concluded that the ocean should be considered as ending at the 60th parallel south latitude. But how old is this ocean? Well, many specialists believe it to have formed only 30 million years ago, which would make it the youngest of the world's oceans. It was created when Antarctica and South America moved away from each other during the early stages of our planet's development. This unique water current is a distinctive component of the Southern Ocean, as it helps keep the waters flowing around the icy continent. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it moves to the east with incredible speed. It's estimated that it moves an enormous amount of water per second. Some of the disputes regarding the Southern Ocean also have to do with this amazing current. Some specialists believe it separates the water of the Southern Ocean from the waters of the nearing Atlantic or Pacific. Only the rapid circulating water is considered the Southern Ocean. On the other hand, though, a handful of scientists say that the current actually makes the naming issue more complex by not limiting the waters to a specific geographic location. They believe that the waters in the current are different in terms of composition from waters in the northern oceans because they are way colder and have a lot more salt. Sailors don't really like this new body of water, mostly because of the frequent cyclone-like storms that it experiences. They happen because of the big temperature difference between the ice packs and the ocean waves. As a result, these storms are very difficult to surpass for any sailors that happen to encounter them. I mean, really, these are the strongest winds found anywhere on our planet. More so, the vessels going through this area must also be wary of the frequent icebergs that may pop up every now and then, and also of the low surface temperatures. Just to paint you a better picture, some of the icebergs found here can span over several hundred meters and can exist all year round, regardless of the season. The latitudes from 50 to 70 have even earned the nicknames of Furious 50s or the Shrieking 60s because of these intense year-round storms. Even the landscape is unique. They say the Southern Ocean has bluer glaciers, colder air, and more intimidating mountains than anywhere else in the world. Now, let's get to the mysterious creatures that call this place home, as thousands of species of wildlife live only here and nowhere else in the world. Let's start with the quirky sea pig, or one of the sea cucumbers as it's sometimes called. There are a lot of them in the waters off Antarctica. Why is it called that way, though? Because of its pink hue and round, bloated looks. On a closer look, it even appears to have a little tail and set of ears, just like a pig. They do help a lot with the quality of the waters here, filtering sand and sediment. Then there are the hoff crabs that live on the floor of the Antarctic Sea. The Southern Ocean is a cold-water environment, 
But crabs are more adapted to warmer waters. So, hoff crabs gather around the warmth made by volcanic vents. They get the needed warmth and food here. You can find them in large piles, one on top of another, literally filling the space of the vent openings. Now, wonder how they got their unofficial name? Well, it's because of their apparent similarity to the actor David Hasselhoff, whose impressive chest reminded explorers of the crab. Okay. Ever seen a fish that's completely transparent? You'd have to get to these waters down in the south, but they do exist, and they are simply called the ice fish. You can basically see inside them, being completely clear and all. That's because of their see-through skin and because they don't have any red blood cells. Their special power is that they can use antifreeze to prevent their bodies from going solid in the cold waters of the Southern Ocean. Instead of the standard thicker blood, the red one with hemoglobin, ice fish have thinner blood that moves around more easily throughout their bodies, hence giving them the much-needed nutrients and oxygen. Now, is there a monster hidden in these waters? Some people believe this to be the case. And thanks to recent research, we even have video footage of it. Some Australian researchers stumbled upon a bunch of weird-looking creatures that were swimming near the seafloor of the Southern Ocean. This pink blob-like fish seemed to be propelled by a little pair of fins. To quote them on it, it seemed to resemble a chicken just before you put it in the oven. I'm not sure I even want to know what that looks like. It took them some time and research to identify the monster. It's a shy species of sea cucumber, known more by its uh, creative nickname, the headless chicken monster. We've known this creature has existed since the late 1800s, but we've barely ever seen it. And we've only ever captured it on tape once before when it was spotted in the Gulf of Mexico, which is quite far from the waters off the coast of East Antarctica. There's so much we don't know about this creature, like how many of them exist in our waters and how they live, eat, and reproduce. Ever heard of the emperor penguin? It's not a penguin species that just happens to have a crown on its head, if that's what you're thinking. But they are one of those penguins that inhabit this specific location and are also the largest species of their kind altogether. What makes them special is that they make their colonies on the sea ice, and most of them never step foot on land. More so, penguin dads lose almost half their weight while incubating the eggs. They're also fascinating swimmers, able to dive deeper and longer than any other bird, up to 700 feet. Not to mention they can stay submerged for up to 18 minutes at a time as they gather food. We have yet to uncover all the secrets of the mysterious Southern Ocean, but it's clear that it's home to some unique and fragile marine ecosystems. Recognizing it as a new ocean could be one way to focus the public attention on it and help its conservation. When you look at the seas and oceans on a map, you might think that they just flow into each other. Like there's really only one big ocean and people just arbitrarily gave different names to its different parts. Well, guess what? You'll be amazed at how much more substantial the borders between them actually are. For example, the border between the Pacific and Atlantic oceans is like a literal line between two different worlds. It looks like the two oceans meet at an invisible wall, which does not let them flow into each other and mix their waters. Why on earth does that happen? Obviously, there's no actual invisible wall inside, and water is just water. So what could be interfering with its mixing? Well, the thing is that water isn't just water. There can be different kinds. The Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans have different densities and chemical makeups, the level of salinity and other qualities. One can see by their color that they are far from the same. Borders like this, between two bodies of water with different physical and biological characteristics, are known as haloclines. Jacques-Yves Cousteau discovered one of them while he was deep diving in the Strait of Gibraltar. The layers of water with different solidity looked like they were divided with a transparent film, and each layer had its own distinct flora and fauna. Haloclines appear when water in one ocean or sea is at least five times saltier than in the other. You can create a halocline at home if you pour some seawater or colored salty water in a glass and then add some fresh water on top of it. The only difference is that your halocline will be horizontal and ocean haloclines are vertical. 
For those of you who were paying attention in chemistry class, you might remember that if you have two liquids with different densities in one space, the denser liquid should eventually end up below the less dense one. By that logic, the border between the two oceans should look not like a vertical line, but a horizontal one. And the difference between their solidity would become less obvious the closer they got to each other. So why doesn't it work like that? Firstly, the difference in density of the two oceans is not big enough for one of them to sink down and the other one to rise up, but it is big enough to not let them mix. Another reason is inertia. There is an inertial force known as the Coriolis force, which influences objects when they are moving in a system of axes, which in turn are moving as well. In simpler terms, the Earth is moving, and all the moving objects on it are carried along acted upon by this Coriolis force, deviating slightly from their natural course. As a result, the objects on the Earth's surface don't move straight on, but deviate in a curve, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. But because the Earth is moving slowly, after all, it does take the planet a whole day to make a full circle around its axis, the Coriolis effect isn't easy to observe in the short term it becomes easier to notice only in long-term intervals, like with cyclones or ocean flows. And this is why the direction of flows in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans is different. This difference also doesn't let them mix. Another important difference between these two ocean waters is the strength of molecule connection, or surface tensile strength. Thanks to this strength, molecules of the same kind hold on to each other. The two oceans have totally different surface tensile strengths, which also doesn't let them mix. Maybe if the waters were completely still, they could gradually start mixing over time. But as they flow in opposite directions, they just don't have time to do this. We think that it's just water in both oceans, but its separate molecules meet for just a very short moment and then get carried away with the ocean flow. But if you think that it's only the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans that don't get along with each other, you are sorely mistaken. There's lots of places on the planet where the waters of the two seas or rivers don't mix, and for even more weird reasons. For example, there's a different kind of border called a thermocline. These are borders between waters of different temperatures, like between the warm water of the Gulf Stream and the much colder North Atlantic Ocean. But the most interesting kinds are called chemoclines. These are borders between waters having different microclimate and chemical makeup. The Sargasso Sea is the biggest and most widely known chemocline. It is a sea within the Atlantic Ocean, which has no shores, but is very obviously distinct. You can't not notice it. Let's now take a look at some other spectacular clines we have on planet Earth. And just as a heads up, I might mispronounce some of these names coming up, so please forgive me. First up, we have the North and Baltic Seas. These two seas meet near the Danish city of Skagen, the water in them doesn't mix because of different densities. Sometimes you can see the waves of the two seas clash into each other, making foam. Their waters do mix very, very gradually. That's why the Baltic Sea is slightly saline. If there had been no water coming to it from the North Sea, it would have just been a freshwater lake. Next up, the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. They meet at the Strait of Gibraltar and have both a different density and salinity. So there's two reasons their waters don't mix. Then we have the Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. The place where they meet is near the Antilles, and it's very easy to spot. It looks like someone has painted water with two different shades of blue. Another place where these two meet is Eleuthera Island of the Bahamas. The Caribbean Sea water is turquoise, and the Atlantic Ocean water is dark blue. There is also the Suriname River and the Atlantic Ocean, which meet near Paramaribo in South America. How about the Uruguay River and its afflux? These two meet in Misiones province in Argentina. One of them is claimed to be used in agriculture, and the other has an almost red tint to it because of loam during rainy seasons. Here's an interesting one. The Rio Negro and the Solimoes Rivers, part of the Amazon River. Six miles from Manaus in Brazil, the Rio Negro and Solimoes Rivers flow into each other, but don't mix for about 2.5 miles. The Rio Negro is dark and the Solimoes is light. They have different temperatures and speeds of flow. Then there's the Moselle and Rhine rivers, which meet in Koblenz, Germany. The water in the Rhine is lighter than that of the Moselle. Okay, 
How about three different bodies? Like the Ilz, Danube, and Inn rivers. The junction of these three rivers is in Passau, Germany. The Ilz is a small mountain river to the left, the Danube is in the middle, and the Inn is a light river to the right. The Inn is wider than the Danube here, but is still its afflux. Take a look at the Alaknanda and Bhagirati rivers, which meet in India. Alaknanda is dark, and Bhagirati is light. I really hope I got those right. The Irtish and Ulba rivers flow into each other in Kazakhstan, near the city whose name is Ust Kamenogorsk. The Irtish has clean water, and the Ulba's water is cloudy. Moving further east, the Jianling and Yangtze rivers meet in Chongqing, China. I really hope that's close at least. The Jialing is clean and the Yangtze is brown. The Irtish River actually has another intersection with the Om River. These two rivers flow into each other in Omsk, Russia. Here, the Irtish is cloudy and the Om is pure and transparent. Speaking of Russia, the Chuya and Katun rivers meet in the Altai Republic. The water of the Chuya has an unusual cloudy white color here and looks dense and thick. The Katun, by contrast, is clean and turquoise. Flowing into each other, they form a single two-colored stream that does not mix for some time. On the other side of the globe, we have the Green and Colorado Rivers. The place of their junction is National Park Canyonlands in Utah, USA. The Colorado River is brown and the green is, well, green. The corridors of these rivers go through rocks with different chemical makeup. That's why they have such a big contrast of colors. Last, but not least, we have the Rhone and Arve rivers. They flow into each other in Geneva, Switzerland. The Rhone is a pure river that flows out from the lakes of Geneva, while the Arve is cloudy and gets its water from the glaciers of the Chamonix Valley. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the strange climes on our beautiful planet, but as you can see, it happens a lot more often than you think. These are the kinds of environmental oddities that can really teach you about the way the natural world works. If you're curious enough, of course. Thanks for watching. Oh, and let me know how well I did with the pronunciations. Constructive feedback is always helpful. A wanderer walking through a desert feels the scorching sun like never before. You can see him from afar thanks to his shining clothes. His long hoodie is covered with foil. It reflects sunlight and protects him from heat. The ground is so hot that shoe soles can melt on it. That's why the wanderer's boots are covered with heat-resistant material. A cloudless sky, barren land, and heat. But the wanderer is not in the desert. He's walking on the ocean's bottom. He doesn't know why this happened, but all the oceans on Earth dried up. It happened almost instantly, and even the greatest minds in the world don't know why. The Wanderer knows only one thing. When it happened, his family was on the other side of the ocean. For several months, he's been traveling across this lifeless land. And he won't stop until he finds his family. The landscape around is spectacular. People have finally found out the secrets of the ocean depths. The seabed consists of huge mountain ranges and volcanoes. They fell asleep forever after the water had disappeared. Also. There are huge trenches leading to the unexplored depths of the planet. People had to build bridges to get over these enormous cracks in the ground. But most of the ocean floor is flat plains. Boundless, lifeless, merciless. The wanderer is walking across a huge canyon. Once, it was swarming with sea life. The man puts on a gas mask, but not because of a sandstorm. Many fish and other marine inhabitants used to live in such canyons. Now. All that's left is a terrible smell. The wanderer passes by huge skeletons of whales. Among them, he notices dirty tents. People are hiding there from heat. The temperature in the area is much higher than in the Sahara Desert. One of the main functions of the ocean was to distribute heat all over the planet. The sun emits heat and radiation. The ocean absorbed this energy. Lots of currents were warm, and they carried this warmth around the world. The water got heated at the equator, then it evaporated and turned into clouds. When warm air rose, it pulled along colder air from below. This allowed the energy to be evenly distributed. In simple words, the ocean cooled hot places and brought warmth to cold ones. Now there's none of this. 
Every day the sun burns the equator and dries up the rest of the planet. The wanderer doesn't come close to the tents. He is carrying the most valuable treasure in the world and doesn't want people to notice him. The inhabitants of Earth are just trying to survive, and many have forgotten about such a thing as morality. Fortunately, the wanderer still remembers. The thoughts of the family help him remain a good person. Sometimes it complicates his life. Like now, for example. In the distance, he sees a young girl. She doesn't look well. There's no one around, and the wanderer decides to help her. Out of his backpack, he pulls a thing worth more than all the gold on the planet. A bottle of water. The girl takes a few sips, but instead of thanking the wanderer, she starts screaming. It's a trap! Her accomplices appear from different sides. Looters. They're gonna take everything. The wanderer runs away. He hasn't eaten for several days, and his strength is leaving him. He won't be able to keep going much longer. The marauders are closing in on him. The wanderer throws the bottle aside. His pursuers rush to the water like crazy. They forget about the mate and fight one another for the bottle. The chances of the wanderer's survival have greatly decreased. He could make this bottle last at least several days. Plus, he's also lost a lot of fluid because of running. In the beginning, there was no panic because of a lack of water. The ocean dried up, but its waters were salty anyway. People still had seas, lakes, and rivers. But the problem was that the ocean was feeding them. When the ocean water evaporated, it formed clouds. These clouds moved all over the world and enriched lakes and rivers with rain. Now, there are almost no clouds. The sun started heating Earth much more. Lakes and seas dried up alarmingly quickly. At that moment, real chaos began. The sun is going down on the horizon. Sunset is near. It's not so hot anymore. The exhausted wanderer continues walking. In the distance, he notices something that makes him stop, take out a small shovel, and start digging quickly. There's no shelter around, just a flat plain. The wanderer speeds up, otherwise it might be too late. The pit is finally ready. The man jumps down and covers his head with a cloak. A few seconds later, a strong ash storm passes through the entire plain. The smallest particles of ash can penetrate through clothes and get into the lungs. The wind is so strong that it can knock anyone down. When the oceans dried up, the sun began to burn the surface of the planet. This led to massive forest fires. The flames destroyed almost all the trees. Huge clouds of carbon dioxide and ash formed. Driven by the wind, they travel the world and poison everything around. The wanderer is sitting in the pit while a terrible hurricane is sweeping over his head. He thinks of his family and slowly falls asleep. Cold wakes him up. Frosty air chills him to the bone. So it's night now. The wanderer climbs out of the pit and finds himself under bright stars. As soon as the water dried up, almost all clouds disappeared. Factories stopped working. Cars no longer emitted carbon dioxide. Thanks to this, comets and the most distant stars can be seen in the sky. The wanderer has seen them a thousand times, but he's still not used to the breathtaking picture. It's like he's looking at the sky through a telescope. An icy gust of wind brings the wanderer back to reality. He won't survive the night if he doesn't find a warmer place. Before, nights were warmer thanks to the energy of the ocean. Now, as soon as the sun goes down, temperatures drop dramatically. The wanderer needs to move to stay warm. He starts walking faster. Soon, he notices some lights in the distance. It's probably other looters. The wanderer goes deeper into the valley. Stars in the moon illuminate his way. Unfortunately, he is running out of energy. He pulls a protein bar out of his pocket, but he needs at least a bit of water to eat it. To digest food, your body needs liquid. If the wanderer eats the bar, he'll only get thirstier. He can't walk and falls to the ground. He checks his pockets and finds a small kerosene tablet. He lights it using a matchstick. A tiny flame protects him from cold. To distract himself from thirst, the Wanderer takes out an old MP3 player. He charged it during the day using the solar panels on his backpack. The man puts on headphones. Classical music calms him down. He lies on the ground next to the burning tablet. He needs to gain strength to continue his journey tomorrow. It's morning. In an hour, the sun will start burning the ground again. 
It's crucial to find water while he still has some time left. The wanderer inspects the territory and notices a spot where the ground is darker. In his previous life, the wanderer worked as a surveyor. He takes a few steps and touches the ground. It feels cool. There's an underground spring here. He begins to dig. The ground is getting wet. Water starts seeping out of the soil. The wanderer fills his empty bottles. Things don't look that bad anymore. It's getting a bit more difficult to breathe with each new day. In the past, phytoplankton and algae produced up to 70% of all the oxygen on the planet. But not anymore. Several days have passed. The wanderer runs out of water and food again. Fortunately, not for long. He's now walking among huge sunken ships. He sees modern aircraft carriers, liners, and even ancient pirate boats. In the distance, he spots huge mountains. The tops of these rocks are what used to be called the shore. The ocean floor is ending. The thoughts about reuniting with his family give him more strength. The man reaches the top and finds himself in the middle of a ruined city. It's empty. Where have all the people gone? Where is my family now? The wanderer asks himself. The man walks through the abandoned streets and meets an old man. He says that almost all the people who used to live here left the city and went to Antarctica. The wanderer has a new goal. He's going to get to the icy mainland no matter what. He will find his family. You're strapped in a boat cruising down the Amazon River with the sun scorching hot. As you check out your map, your boat starts rocking back and forth. The water is starting to get more intense, so you hang on for dear life. You tuck your map in your pocket and try to take control of your boat. You strike some jagged rocks and duck low to avoid tree branches. Your boat strikes a large rock out of nowhere and capsizes. You're swimming in the murky green water. While you're trying your best to get ashore, your boat gets washed away. Underneath the water lies a whole new world of bizarre and dangerous animals. Kandiru fish are snake-like creatures that can grow up to 16 inches long. Arapimus can weigh more than an adult male and are taller than most basketball players. They're the biggest freshwater fish in South America. They have a hybrid gill system that forces them to pop up to the surface every 5 to 15 minutes to breathe in oxygen for their large swim bladder. You swim out of the raging water and dry yourself off. Oh no, your map is completely soaked. There's no way you can get to your destination without it. You venture into the thick rainforest, shoving the branches and leaves away. As you get deeper, you notice something on a tree. It's barely moving, but it's got sharp claws and a raggedy coat. It stretches its arm to another branch and tries to pull itself up. Ever so slowly. Sloths sleep more than half their days and only head down from trees once a week. They're so motionless, they sometimes grow algae and moss on their fur. The rainforest gets denser with each step until there's barely any sunlight illuminating the path in front of you. You notice a figure following you. With every branch you step on, you can hear a faint sound right next to you creeping around. You start walking a bit faster, and the sound catches up with you. You make it out of the dense part and tread along a narrow path until you reach a cliff. You can't walk normally here, so you pin against the wall and walk sideways to cross the hills. You slowly move across with the river 30 feet below you. You move your right foot, and some rocks fall into the river. You keep going and misstep. You're about to fall, but you hold on to a large tree branch and pull yourself up. You notice a couple of colorful poison frogs inches away from your fingers. Touching any of these frogs can be extremely dangerous and harmful, despite their amazing color patterns. The golden poison frog is one of the most poisonous animals in the world. One of them hops right next to you, so you let go of the branch and fall back in the river. The river is washing you down until you reach a calm current. Underneath you is a swarm of piranhas swimming with their sharp teeth. The red color on their skin is unmistakable, so you swim off like an Olympic athlete. Piranhas will eat anything that gets in their way, no matter the size. You grip onto a log and climb up a small rock to catch your breath. There's a huge electric eel underneath the rock. 
Despite their name, they're more related to catfish than eels. They use their powerful 600 volts of electricity to defend themselves and catch food. You're stuck, unless you're like the common basilisk that can run on the water like a jet ski. These incredible lizards have special webbing on their toes and can run the distance of a basketball court. You hop on a bunch of rocks until you reach the land. You continue walking along the riverbank until you come across a moving rock. You rub your eyes and see it moving again. It's a dinosaur-looking turtle that resembles a crocodile with armor. The Mata Mata is a freshwater turtle that disguises itself with its surroundings to catch prey. Their heads stretch longer than their bodies. You shimmy your way past it and continue. You head back into the rainforest and find a spot to rest. Wait, there are giant ants everywhere! They're the biggest ants in the world and can produce one of the most painful stings out there, even comparable to a wasp's sting. You immediately get up and find another place to rest. As you continue walking along, you notice the same feeling of something following you. You can hear some leaves rustling, but it's getting dark and there's no way of telling. You find a nice little spot to build a campfire and catch some Zs, but in the Amazon, everything is a threat except for those cute capybaras wandering around. They live in groups next to water sources. They're also the biggest rodents in the world. You don't need to worry about them if you're stuck in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Suddenly, you feel something slithering up next to you. You look down and see a massive green anaconda just about to constrict you. They are the heaviest snakes in the world and can grow up to 20 feet long and have a huge appetite. You get up and sprint your way out of there. All right, you found a decent cave to crash in. It's daytime again, and you're still alive. You continue walking along the rainforest. You were able to find some breakfast to boost your energy for the rest of the day. You spot something on a tree that looks like a branch, but it's actually a potu, a master of disguise that can spend days motionless on broken tree branches. These bizarre birds use those branches as their permanent home, where they lay their eggs and chill all day. You continue your way through the rainforest and see a Brazilian wandering spider crawling on a tree branch right in front of you. Eight of these species can be found in the Amazon area. They are some of the most aggressive and venomous spiders out there. So you make a big detour and walk away from it. You feel someone walking next to you again, but you still can't figure out what it is. You see a steep cliff with a waterfall hitting a large lake ahead of you. Looks peaceful, until you see a team of black caimans gathering around the shore. They're the biggest predators in the whole Amazon ecosystem and feed on anything that moves. It's a good thing you're on high ground, otherwise, oh, whoa! You slip and fall down the river, right on the deep end. So far, no caimans spotted you. You swim underwater and try to get to the opposite end of where the reptiles are. As you climb out and dry yourself off, you notice some large black spots on you. You try pulling them off, but they've latched on pretty hard. The Amazon giant leech finds its target by tracking movement and shadow. Once they attach themselves to the skin, it's extremely difficult to extract them. The best way to do so is to slide your finger next to its mouth and pull it off slowly. Ugh. You manage to get them off your body and see that the caimans are swimming towards you. You're pinned to the wall with the lake of hungry reptiles approaching. Suddenly, a pink dolphin jumps out of the water and splashes all over them. They can grow larger than humans and are the celebrities of the Amazon. Scientists think they get their color from the blood capillaries on their skin. The Amazon even has bull sharks swimming around. These carnivorous giant fish are threatening to humans and can swim in both salt water and fresh water. These sharks prey on anything within their reach, including other sharks. The dolphin distracted the caimans, so you climb up the cliff and try to find the best way to escape. Opened jaws waiting for you to fall into the pit are right below you. You're lucky enough to escape to the top, but as your arms pull you up, the first thing that you see is a jaguar looking straight at you. It's the creature that's been following you this whole time. You get up while it starts circling you, timing its strike. You know that you can't take on a jaguar, nor can you outrun it. So you grab a large tree branch from the ground to defend yourself. 
It jumps at you, but you duck down in time. The jaguar lands in the water far away from the Cayman Crocs. It's a good thing these large kitties are excellent swimmers. You pick yourself up and continue. And to your surprise, you find your boat again. You fix it up and sail your way out of the Amazon. Whew. Okay, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? Can you name the sixth largest river on Earth in terms of volume? That's the amount of water that flows through a waterway. The first couple of rivers are easy to list. Number one, of course, is the Amazon River in South America. Then we have the Congo in Africa and the Ganges in India. Feel free to name all the rivers on the planet. You won't get any closer to the answer. Why? Because this river is not on the surface, but underneath the waves of the Black Sea. In 2010, a team of scientists discovered this river while studying the Bosphorus Strait in Turkey. Sonar scanning revealed a channel at the bottom of the Black Sea. The channel had water flowing through it. It turned out that at places, it's 115 feet deep. That's three times as tall as your average telephone pole. This flow of water acts like a real river. It has rapids and waterfalls, and its volume is 350 times greater than that of the River Thames in London. <laughs> Talk about a strong undercurrent. If it was a surface river, it would really be in the top 10. Bad news for the Madeira River in Bolivia and Brazil, the present number 6. But how did this underwater river form? The answer lies in the amazing features of the Black Sea. It gets its water from two main sources. The first are the rivers that flow into it, like the Danube, Dnieper, and Don. <laughs> A lot of Ds there. But more importantly, they are all freshwater waterways. On the other side, quite literally, there is the Mediterranean. And it's salty. Like, a lot. When this salt water gets inside the Black Sea, it goes straight to the bottom. You see, fresh water is lighter than salt water. This creates stratification. It's a fancy term that simply means that the two types of water don't mix together. Salt water has a higher density, so it drops right down to the bottom. If you want to see how that works, you can do an experiment at home. Pour mineral water into one cup and salt water into another. Table salt will do. Then put a grape in each cup you'll see how it immediately sinks to the bottom of the cup filled with fresh water. The grape will stay afloat in the cup filled with salt water. The same thing is happening inside the Black Sea. But there is another side to this phenomenon. The upper layer of water is rich in oxygen. This means it can support life. The bottom layer, however, is anoxic. Yep, you guessed it. This means there is no oxygen at the bottom. But this isn't a bad thing. Because of this trait of the Black Sea, shipwrecks are able to survive for centuries. Oxygen decomposes wood. And from what material did the ancient people make their ships? That's correct, timber. Recently, in 2018, scientists discovered the oldest Greek shipwreck on Earth. The merchant ship lies more than a mile deep at the bottom of the sea. Experts estimate that the vessel is 2,400 years old. The wreck was valuable for historians to study all the elements of ancient ship construction. From the mast to the rowing benches, it's all intact. The wreck lies some 50 miles off the coast of Bulgaria, but no one has seen it in person. Explorers sent a deep sea ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, to film the wreckage. It was impossible for a diver to go down. Hmm, but the Black Sea doesn't look that huge on a map. Could it be that deep? Oh yes, it's way deeper than people think. You could stack six Empire State Buildings at the deepest point of the Black Sea, around 7,257 feet. This inland sea isn't the only place on Earth where researchers have discovered shipwrecks and underwater rivers. One of the largest channels running along the ocean floor lies off the coast of South America. It runs from the mouth of the mighty Amazon and into the Atlantic Ocean. Studying underwater rivers isn't an easy task. The depth and the strong currents make it impossible to send in divers. Even the equipment for underwater research has to be sturdy. Otherwise, the current will just wash it away. 
That's why the underwater river in the Black Sea was ideal for scientists to explore. Earth's oceans and seas are powerful, but lucky for us, there are places where divers can admire underwater rivers. Ever heard of a cenote? Sounds Spanish. Well, that's because it is. Cenotes are underground caves. They form after the limestone above collapses, revealing the groundwater under them. The term cenote is associated with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Ancient Maya used them as water sources. In the Mayan language, the word cenote meant sacred well. Researchers estimate there are some 10,000 cenotes spread across the Yucatan Peninsula. You can also find them in other places, such as Cuba and Australia. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but unofficially, the most beautiful cenote is located just south of the town of Tulum in Mexico. The name reflects the cave's divine beauty, Cenote Angelita. But people don't visit this cenote to go swimming. Its bottom is much more interesting. A scuba tank is all you need to finally admire an underwater river firsthand. The waters are dark and foggy, so divers use powerful flashlights. After a hundred foot dive, a marvelous sight appears. An underwater river with trees along its banks. Some of them even have green leaves, just like any other water flow on dry land. But it's not really a river. Here comes the fascinating part. Remember how salt water and fresh water don't mix? Well, the river the divers see is actually a thick layer of fog between the two types of water. Three feet of hydrogen sulfates to be exact. This is the compound that water processing plants use to remove chlorine from drinking water. The substance is so heavy that the fog it produces moves independently from the surrounding water. And it creates an illusion that a river is flowing underwater. But there are other real rivers that play tricks on you. Take, for example, the Mystery River in Indiana. It's the longest underground river in the United States. Explorers discovered the river and its cave system, Blue Spring Caverns, in the 19th century. Nearly three miles of the river are navigable. Isn't that impressive? You can book a boat tour on a river that you can't even see. But the most mysterious river on the planet is the Saraswati River in India. The coolest part about it is that it doesn't exist. It was an alleged river only mentioned in ancient literature. For centuries, people thought that it was just a myth. Then satellite images showed that it might be real. Ancient texts spoke of a major confluence of three mighty rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Saraswati. The first two are visible today, but where's the third one? That's what scientists decided to find out. Images from an American satellite showed the presence of underground water in the area. Until then, researchers thought that these were paleo channels. This simply means that water flowed through them a long time ago. But to their surprise, it appeared that there was still water inside these channels. Scientists estimated that the Saraswati River flowed above the ground some 5,000 years ago. But it didn't dry up completely. It just went underground, some 200 feet below the ground. Local experts believe that the river still slowly flows into the sea. The Saraswati River got hidden under the desert sand. This was a natural process. But many rivers have been forced underground because of human activity. In London, England, several dozen small and medium-sized rivers now flow under the ground. Maps from the 19th century still show them as rivers. But today, they only exist in the names of the streets that were built above them, such as Fleet Street. The same thing happened in New York. But this doesn't mean that these streams have disappeared for good. When engineers want to rebuild or modify a building, they still consult city maps from centuries ago. No one wants a long-lost brook to flood their basement. The Amazon River travels through nine South American countries at a length of over 4,000 miles. Still, it's impossible to cross it by a bridge. With the river being the main highway, traveling through this dense forest and so few areas populated around the river, there's just no reason to have one. 
The river can rise up to 30 feet, and the river crossings that were only 3 miles wide can expand to over 30 miles in just a few short weeks in certain spots, making a bridge nearly impossible to build here. In New Zealand, in the coastal town of Mauraki, there are huge spherical boulders. Some rocks are 6.5 feet tall and weigh about 7 tons, as much as 10 cows. Ooh, there's a 10-cow boulder! Maori legend has it that these rocks are from the remains of the goods from a large shipwreck that happened hundreds of years ago. From a more scientific perspective, it's sand and gravel combined to form these giant boulders. Waves and winds give them a smooth, round appearance over time. The whole process might take millions of years. Indonesia's Kaiwan Ijen volcano is famous for a stunning turquoise-colored lake sitting at the top of the peak, but don't dip in. It's an acid lake. But its scariest part is the sulfuric gases leaking out when lava flows freely, reaching temperatures hotter than 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. When those gases come in contact with the air, they combust into a spectacular electric blue flame. That's why the volcano has blue lava. The island of Surtsey, south of Iceland, was formed over 50 years ago by a volcanic eruption. It all began back in 1963, when a powerful volcanic eruption created one of the youngest islands on the planet. All sorts of bacteria, fungi, and molds began taking over the island, leading to numerous other animals finding their way here, like seals and birds. Birds and ocean waves deposited seeds all over the island. Sadly, the island's getting smaller now because of water and wind erosion. Located off the coast of Brazil, there's an island called… I'm a bit rusty on my Portuguese, so here it is on the screen. It looks perfectly untouched and pristine. Bad news? Dangerous snakes overrun it completely, so take a doctor with you in case you want to go there. Over 4,000 of the golden lancehead vipers inhabit this island. These 3-foot-long snakes are among the most venomous in the entire world. Yeah, I think I'll skip that. Landing down under, you can see the Opera House, Uluru, lots of kangaroos, and catch the strangest wave of the world, Wave Rock in Western Australia. It's not made of water, but stone. It can be up to 50 feet tall and almost 300 feet long. It's especially incredible after rains in winter, when the Western Australian wildflowers fill up the entire landscape. In Atlanta, there's a world of Coca-Cola Museum. The formula for the secret recipe is in a large security vault, heavily guarded at all times. Only a handful of people can get through those vault doors. Since its creation in 1886, the company has kept it a secret for only the most honest employees. In 2006, a former worker tried to sell the formula to Pepsi, only for Pepsi to call the police and inform Coca-Cola. The polka dot legs is a must for anyone who is in British Columbia. After the summer's scorching heat evaporates the lake's water, it leaves behind yellow, blue, and green water spots. These pools are full of all sorts of minerals, like sodium, calcium, and magnesium sulfates, that get concentrated in the pools. You can't get too close or even dip your feet into them. A fence protects the entire lake with a sign about how culturally and ecologically sensitive the area is. In Death Valley, California, there's a mystery of the sailing stones. Since the early 1900s, the mystery of how all these stones were seemingly moving by themselves across the desert floor baffled everyone. Some believe that the rocks move by thin pieces of ice around the stones pushed by winds after winter. No one ever saw any of these rocks moving until 2014. Scientists set time-lapse recorders, and the footage showed the rocks sliding along the ground over time. The marble caves in Chile, located in the beautiful area of Patagonia, formed from over 6,000 years of waves wearing down the rocks. The crystal blue walls reflect the vibrant turquoise water, making it perfect for kayaking. Walking in Chestnut Ridge Park in New York, one can see an eternal flame. What makes this one stand out, though, is it's underneath a waterfall. Occasionally, the flame will go out for short periods, but it will light up again. Sometimes it's thanks to certain hikers along the way. If you ever stop your car on a magnetic hill in New Brunswick, Canada, you'll see the car might start rolling backwards up the hill, all by itself. While it looks like it's moving the wrong way, this is just an illusion. There are several hills like this all around the world. What looks like an incline is the opposite, all because there's no horizon for perspective. The brightest bioluminescent bay in the world, called Puerto Mosquito, is located off the coast of Puerto Rico. 
The bay is named for the pirate, Roberto Cofrisi, and his small boat, El Mosquito. Not after those annoying insects. During the summer months, you'll have glassy water at night with millions of tiny microorganisms bumping into each other and emitting blue light. The Chocolate Hills in the Philippines is a group of unusually shaped hills located in the middle of the island of Bohol in the Philippines. There are 1,000 to 2,000 discovered so far. They have nothing to do with chocolate at all, but they resemble the color after the dry season, when the grass turns from green to brown. In the northeastern part of Thailand, 466 miles away from Bangkok, is a 75-million-year-old rock formation sticking right out of the mountains. Their shapes look just like a pod of whales swimming together. No wonder this place is called Three Whale Rocks. Millions of years ago, this area was just a desert, but this land has changed quite dramatically during this time. These sandstone mountains were lifted up by plate tectonics, that's the shifting of the crust layers, called lithosphere, and erosion by the Mekong River, resulting in the strangely shaped rock formations we see today. Salar de Uni in Bolivia is the world's largest salt flat. At 4,050 square miles in size, it's twice as large as Grand Canyon National Park. After winter has passed, the Salt Lake is transformed into a beautiful giant sky-reflecting mirror between September and May. With salt all the way to the horizon, it creates an illusion of endlessness. The thin layer of water left over from ice melting creates a shimmering effect of the sky, making it one of the best places to visit in the world. The Catambo River in Venezuela might be the stormiest place in the world, with nearly 300 storm days a year. The lightning storms are so consistent, and they're predicted three months in advance. During the wet season in October, you might see 30 lightning flashes in a single minute. At sunset, strong winds flow around the three surrounding mountains, forming storm clouds over the water. When the water droplets of humid air collide with ice crystals from the cold air, the static charges cause a lightning storm that happens nearly every night. Off the southern tip of Japan lies the Yanaguni Formation. Archaeologists believe that the monument belongs to a fabled Pacific civilization, like Atlantis, that vanished beneath the waves thousands of years ago. If it's truly a lost civilization, or just nature having a little fun, this is the site to dive into. Features inside the structure resemble stonework, like castles, temples, and a stadium, connected by roads and what seems to be large walls all the way around. There are even marks in the stone that appear to show quarry work, faded faces, and rocks sculpted into animal shapes. Some scientists believe that the symmetry of the stones is not as straight as reported. It appears solid rock rather than carved blocks weathered down by all the water over many years. Plitvice Lakes National Park in Croatia is an interconnected chain of waterfalls, the tallest being 230 feet, and underground water channels, creating natural dams and lakes in such a picturesque environment. Found in the deep woodlands surrounded by meadows brimming with wildflowers, brown bears, gray wolves, lynx, deer, and plenty of rare bird species for bird watchers call these 115 square miles of the National Park home. Ah, beautiful. You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today. Like it has some kind of ring around it. A rainbow type thing. Huh. Look at that. Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly at the... Stop everything! He says. It's a sun halo! We need to find shelter now! Unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you! A sun halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage, so it's not worth it. Grab some sunglasses and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts around 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. In June 2020, what the people were looking at was an anvil cloud, a rare storm formation in the sky. Formed when strong air currents carry water vapor upwards, the air expands and spreads out as it hits the bottom of the stratosphere. 
it pushes the dense cloud into the cool anvil shape you see. And sometimes it even gets to be a mushroom. Anvil clouds produce some of the most dangerous lightning of all storms. One that's called a bolt out of the blue. This lightning strike seems to magically come out of the blue sky, with the storm being many miles away. This type of bolt comes from the top of the anvil and can be 10 times more powerful than a typical lightning strike. People got so frightened after witnessing a giant cloud that they thought something terrible must have happened. The locals had pictures of the large billow on social media before officials could explain what was going on. Authorities managed to calm everyone's fears by informing them it was nothing more than a natural phenomenon, and a beautiful one at that. Before dissipating, these clouds typically stay in one area, regardless of how strong the wind is. If you look off the western coast of France, you'll see the Isle of Ré. Thanks to its beautiful blue waters, clean sandy beaches, and stunning lighthouses, this place is a very popular vacation spot. But perhaps the coolest part about the island of Ré is what you see just beyond the shore. Square waves. This strange wave pattern looks like a giant chessboard over the ocean. Many visitors to the island become captivated by these waves, and go to high up places like nearby lighthouses to take pictures of this natural phenomenon. They say that when looking down at these square patterns in the water, it's almost as if there's some sort of metal grid underneath it. And while these wave patterns are truly fascinating, the people who choose to enjoy them from afar are doing it right. They know to stay out of the water. To understand how these square waves come to be, it's important to know how waves occur in the first place. Generally, waves can travel many miles over the surface of the water, depending on local winds and weather. And even on days when the weather seems somewhat calm, storms located elsewhere can send in crashing waves that affect the surrounding calm waters. When waves travel onto the shores of distant lands, they're called swells. This is different from a wave that occurs from local wind. When two different swells coming from opposite directions meet, it's known as a cross sea. This is what generates these square waves you see near the Isle of Ré. While these waves are one of the reasons why people flock to this island, they can still expect to enjoy calm, relaxing waters most of the time. The cross sea only occurs during certain times of the year in specific weather. Plus, it's common knowledge around Ré to steer clear of the ocean when these square waves appear. So it's not often that you hear about anyone getting caught in them, because most people know better. And since a lot of people on the island are tourists, there are plenty of signs around warning them to get out of the water during this time. However, not everyone gets the memo. There have been a handful of cases where people got caught in the cross sea, but thankfully and luckily, they managed to get out safely. These square waves have become somewhat famous over time given that there's really no other place in the world that boasts a cross sea like this one. In fact, no one has ever spotted square waves anywhere but the island of Ray. However, there are swells that can be found throughout the oceans in the world, and a cross sea can take place. But if the angle they approach each other at is more shallow, the wave may actually look like it's coming from the same direction, even when it's not. Not to mention, swells can slowly lose momentum as they drift further and further away. So their crest, or the top of the wave, appears more round and less jagged. The island of Ray's specific wind and weather patterns are literally the perfect storm and create a cross sea that people can clearly recognize. It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously, but after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. 
After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Oh, creepy. The Christmas Island Crab is part of an amazing phenomenon once a year. Their migration period is determined by the phase of the moon and the first rainfall between October and February, although the precise date can't be predicted. Once the crabs have been prompted, they leave their homes amongst the forest and migrate in massive hordes towards the sea. Numbering in millions, a sea of red crabs is observed as they make their journey across the island, creating roadblocks and making their way to the ocean. There, they lay their eggs and then make their trek back, returning to the forest until the next year. There are bridges in the Indian state of Meghalaya that are created entirely of living tree roots. The bridges are made up of tangled thick roots that are strong enough to hold over 50 people at a time. The Kasi and Jaintia tribes became masters in the art of growing these insane bridges. They need them to cross the streams below with ease. Some of these root bridges are over 180 years old. To make them, the members of the tribes care for the roots until they grow long enough to reach the opposite bank. It can take as long as 10 to 15 years to grow a bridge. In the process, the roots become tightly entwined with one another. This is how the bridges get so strong. And once a bridge is fully grown, it can last for over 500 years. While some roots decay, new ones are continually growing. That's why the unusual natural constructions last so long. Light pillars are colorful beams of light that either jet up from Earth towards the sky or shine down from the clouds. Usually, they only occur in cold temperatures as they form when the sunlight gets reflected off ice crystals floating in the air. The higher the crystals are in the air, the taller these bright and colorful pillars become. They're most common at sunrise and sunset. There are hidden caves all over the world that are filled with glowing light. This light comes from hundreds of glowworms that have made a cozy home in the caves. Some of the caves are more than 30 million years old, and most of them can be found in New Zealand and Australia. The worms themselves don't actually glow, but baby worms, called larvae, form silk strings made out of mucus. These strings form nets. It's these nets that can illuminate the entire cave. Their purpose is to attract flies and other tasty insects for the glowworms to munch on. Rainbow trees are 100% a real thing. Hailing from the Philippines and Indonesia, these colorful wonders are called rainbow eucalyptus, or rainbow gum. The rainbow hues are created by the contrast in colors of old and new bark. As the thin surface layers of bark peel away, they reveal newer ones with brighter, more eye-catching colors. The brand new bark is green, then it changes to purple, then red, and finally brown. This is because the trees contain a substance called chlorophyll. It makes the bark green. As each strip of bark ages, it loses chlorophyll and slowly changes its color. You're hiking in the wilderness, looking for a safe spot to set up camp. All you can hear are leaves and branches crackling under your footsteps. Some squirrels are running up a tree over there. But suddenly, something unexpected happens. You notice something weird in the distance in between the trees. It kind of looks like a concrete structure of some kind. Weird. At this point, you're at least 20 miles deep into the woods, and there are no nearby towns or villages, as far as you know. So, you decide to go off the trail with your friends to get a closer look. But as you get nearer, you realize that it's leading to nowhere. Hmm, what's it doing here, in the middle of literally nowhere? And it doesn't even lead to anything. You put on your Sherlock Holmes cap and investigate. So, maybe there used to be an old house or mansion here that collapsed over the years, and the only thing left is a staircase? But, weirdly enough, after circling the bizarre structure, you realize there's no trace of any ruins or even foundations. It's like someone just sliced a staircase off their house, cake style, and plopped it here for no reason. Okay? You and your friends aren't really into getting a whole lot closer. 
something feels wrong. The longer you look at this weird structure, the more you feel a super creepy presence. Something tells you you should probably leave the area as fast as possible. As weird as this sounds, discoveries of random staircases illogically found in the woods are surprisingly common. Some are made of wood, others of brick or stone. Some look ancient, while others look like they were finished yesterday. The one thing they all have in common, they all lead to absolutely nowhere, and they're all found in super mysterious locations. One of the most famous ones is in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. A long, medieval-looking staircase made of stones with Roman arches in the middle of the woods. It's believed to have been part of Madame Antoinette Sherry's castle. She was a big singer back in Paris. The castle dates back about 100 years, and it was later discovered again in 1962. This time, there was nothing but a staircase. Another mysterious ancient staircase dates back to 9,000 years ago. It's in a forest in Italy. It looks like a series of stairs that lead to a tiny platform at the top. Now, why go through all the trouble of building the thing if it leads to nowhere? Well, some scientists think it could have been some sort of ritual tower. But your guess is as good as theirs. There's an anomaly in the Indian Ocean known as the Indian Ocean Geoid Low, or IOGL. It produces the largest distorting natural gravitational force in the world. Heavy mineral deposits, many deep-sea trenches, and magma reservoirs disturb the magnetic field in this area. Earth's gravity changes in different places around the planet. It allows researchers to look for patterns and figure out what's happening beneath the surface. Higher gravity fields usually mean denser materials below and vice versa. Some scientists believe that the anomaly might be a dent in the planet's mantle that is working its way up to the crust. The Nihau Island actually rejects the fruits of today's advancements. There are no cars in sight since the locals get around on foot or by bicycles. No wonder their legs have great definition. They thrive without running water, internet, or shops. The only school on the entire island is powered by solar energy with a backup generator. And what's awesome is that it's the only school in the state that's powered by the sun. Being a resident of the island, the local explains some ground rules the permanent residents must abide by. If they do break these rules, they can be evicted. Now, not far from Bangkok, in northeastern Thailand, there's a 75-million-year-old rock formation. These rocks look like three whales swimming together. The beautiful design created by nature became known as Three Whales Rock. Millions of years ago, this area was just a desert. But the land was changing. Gradually, sandstone got pulled apart by the movements of tectonic plates and erosion. That's how these spectacular formations were created. If you decide to explore the system of trails around Three Whales Rock, you'll find waterfalls and an abundance of fauna and flora there. Located on Gamal and Gaiden peninsulas, these expansive pit holes were discovered in 2014. They seem to be still changing and evolving. The pits grow wider, and people find them more often. Of course, there's no shortage of theories about how they appeared. Suggestions range from meteorite impacts to the activity of other civilizations. But the most common explanation is that methane gas reacted to water molecules after the planet's permafrost started to melt. This resulted in bubbles of methane bursting through the ice. The craters could be thousands of years old, but nobody knows for sure. You're driving to the state of New Mexico, to the small town of Taos. 2% of the locals hear a strange buzzing in the air every day. Some residents believe the sound is somehow connected with technologies used by guests from other galaxies. Ooh. Also, there is a theory that something sinister lives in the town. They say Taos is cursed. An evil spirit or a phantom punishes people for something their ancestors did in the past. Scientists still can't explain the nature of this sound. Another theory says it's caused by unusual acoustics of the location, while others think the buzzing is a hallucination. Some can hear it because everybody talks about something, and our minds create an illusion of the sound that doesn't really exist. 
The sound isn't the same for everyone, either. For some, it's a low hum. For others, it's more of a buzzing sound. But this is not the only place where you can hear the strange noises. It's called the hum, and people worldwide claim to have heard it. Some dwellers of a small village in Scotland describe it as a low, thick hum. Well, some residents of Florida heard a similar sound, too. It's not exactly known where this phenomenon appeared. But the first time the media started talking about it was in the 1970s in England. Also, there are written records of a mysterious buzzing dating back almost 200 years. According to some estimates, only about 2% of people on the planet can hear the hum. Perhaps their ears pick up some low-frequency waves, or the reason is something else entirely. Maybe, just maybe, they hear humming because the person doing it doesn't know the words to the song. Yeah, that joke is also 200 years old. A volcano in Indonesia spews bright blue lava and produces electric blue and purple flames. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano has some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. You can also know you're near it by its foul stench. But I digress. And when sulfuric gases interact with scorching hot air and get lit by the molten lava, they turn blue. You can also find the world's largest acid lake inside this crater. Yep, it's a real stinker. Underwater rivers and lakes are called brine pools for a reason. High salinity makes the water in them denser than the seawater around. That's why it sinks to the bottom, forming rivers and lakes. Those have waves of their own, and these waves can sometimes lap up against the shorelines. If you went down there in the submarine, it would easily float on the surface of a brine pool. But without a submarine, swimming in such a lake would be too risky. They contain too much toxic methane and hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, I'd pass on that too. But hey, be my guest! Cave of Crystals in Mexico is home to the world's most unique crystal formations. Thanks to super-rare conditions in the cave, crystals there grow to unbelievable sizes. The air inside is incredibly humid. The water contains tons of minerals that boost the growth of the Milky White giants. Some of them are longer than telephone poles. Cylindrical snow donuts occur when a wind gust starts to roll some snow across a snowy area, as if making a snowball. If it was a real thing, it would eventually become too heavy for the wind to move. But a snow donut's center is hollowed out. This happens because its inner layer is too thin and is blown away when the donut is formed. This makes the thing lighter than a snowball. That's also why it rolls further. Unfortunately, snow donuts are rare because they need very precise conditions to appear. The Danakil Depression in Ethiopia is probably one of the most bizarre-looking places you'll ever see. It's dotted with neon-colored hot springs, lava pools, and vast salt flats. You've got to be especially careful there. Toxic gases are swirling over hydrothermal fields, and many pools are super acidic. So, mm, don't go swimming. Until at least 30 minutes after lunch. <laughs> Just kidding. And finally, there's nothing mysterious about 28,000 rubber ducks found in the sea in 1992. That's when a ship transporting bath toys got lost in the ocean while traveling from Hong Kong to the U.S., some of these ducks are still floating in the ocean several decades later. They've been spotted in South America, Alaska, Hawaii, and even Australia. And they make bath time lots of fun. Ooh, rubber ducky. The Empire State Building's tower was designed to serve as a docking station for dirigibles. At that time, people believed that these airships would become the main means of transportation in the future. The project included gangplanks check-in and customs offices, and so on. But then the engineers realized that the wind up there was too strong for their plans, and they gave up on their idea. Angel Falls, the largest uninterrupted waterfall on the planet, is more than twice as tall as the Empire State Building. During the dry season, the falling water sometimes evaporates before it reaches the ground. One of the most mysterious sounds ever heard on Earth was the bloop. It occurred in 1997 and resembled the noise of marine animals. But the volume was too great for a sound produced by a living creature. The bloop continued for one minute. It started from a low rumble and then rose in frequency. 
Antarctica might just look like a giant field of ice, but there's actually a huge continent underneath. That means that it has volcanoes, mountains, and valleys, like any other continent. Scientists have recently discovered that the Antarctic landmass has the lowest point on the planet, as well as huge mountain ranges. If any of the numerous volcanoes were to erupt, it would melt a huge part of the surface ice and increase the spill of ice into the ocean. The sea level would rise and flood coastal areas around the world. The ocean waters would also be disrupted, putting marine life at risk, though all of these volcanoes are dormant at the moment. Each day on the South Pole lasts six months on this continent. The South Pole only has a single sunset and sunrise across an entire year. Early Earth might have been purple, not green. There's a theory that ancient microbes used molecules rather than chlorophyll to absorb sunlight. These molecules likely gave living organisms a violet tint. During the Stone Age, the entire population of Central Europe was around 1,500 people, which means they would all fit on a mid-sized cruise liner these days. Astronomers have figured out that the Milky Way weighs around 1.5 trillion solar masses, and one solar mass is the mass of our Sun. A tiny part of this weight is a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy and 200 billion stars. The rest is dark matter, mysterious and invisible. If all sheets of Arctic ice and glaciers melted at the same time, the sea level would rise for the height of a 26-story building. Under black or UV light, ripening bananas look bright blue. That's because of the chlorophyll that's breaking down when the fruit is ripening. Because of tectonic plate movements, the Pacific Ocean shrinks every year, and the Atlantic Ocean gets bigger by the same amount. These days, there are only two ice sheets in the world left after the planet's last ice age. The first is the Greenland Ice Sheet. The second, the Antarctic Ice Sheet, is enormous. It's the size of Mexico and the continental U.S. combined. Tsunami waves often go unnoticed. They don't rise for more than several inches above the surface until they reach shallow waters. When the ocean is deep, though, they can travel as fast as a long-distance passenger airplane. Corals that live in shallow waters produce their own protection from the sun. Without it, sunlight would harm the algae living inside them. To protect these algae, which are the main source of food for the corals, they fluoresce. This process makes proteins that act as sunscreen. Almost 90% of the volcanic activity on Earth happens in the oceans. The South Pacific has the largest concentration of volcanoes people know about. There's one volcano cluster that has 1,133 volcanic cones. All of them are active and cooped up in an area the size of New York State. The Zemchug Canyon in the middle of the Bering Sea is the largest underwater canyon ever discovered. There are more treasures and artifacts at the bottom of the ocean than in all museums in the world combined. In 1900, one of the biggest hurricanes struck near Central America and in the Gulf of Mexico. It then went as far as Florida and Texas and is considered to be the most devastating hurricane in the United States history. They first detected it on August 27th and it lasted for many days. By the time it reached the Texas coast, the storm had turned into a Category 4 hurricane. Hurricanes are categorized on wind speed and intensity using something called a Saffir-Simpson scale. There are five different categories from 1 to 5, with 1 being the weakest and 5 being the strongest. The people of Galveston had less than four days to prepare for the arriving storm that even stretched out to Oklahoma and Kansas. The Great Hurricane then made its way to the Great Plains and turned towards the Great Lakes, New England, and reached southeastern Canada. The storm was so bad that more than 3,600 homes were damaged even though they were sturdy enough to withstand the storm. Given the population numbers back then, it was equivalent to hundreds of thousands of houses destroyed, if not millions. Spotted Lake, Canada. They call it the most magical spot in Canada. In winter and spring, this is just a regular lake that looks like any other. But try going there in the summer when the water starts to evaporate. It'll feel as if you've entered a different world, a polka-dotted landscape with blue, green, and yellow spots. Over the summer, there are over 300 pools there, and they all look magical. 
Over the centuries, people believed each of them had different healing properties. Oh, and the explanation for the vibrant colors is pure science. Each of them has a high concentration of different minerals. We live inside the sun. Its atmosphere stretches far beyond its visible surface. And even though Earth is 93 million miles away from the star, it's still within reach of the sun's atmosphere. Auroras happen when charged particles from the sun get caught by Earth's magnetic field and crash into the upper atmosphere near the poles. Our planet is gradually slowing down the speed of its rotation. It happens at an unhurried pace of 17 milliseconds per 100 years. Because of this, our days are becoming longer, and still, only after 140 million years, a day on Earth will last 25 hours. Earth's southernmost continent, Antarctica, is the only the fifth largest one, but it contains almost 70% of the planet's fresh water and 90% of the world's ice. Antarctica is also considered to be a desert. Lots of rocks on Earth have a Martian origin. Scientists analyze the chemical content of some meteorites found in the Sahara Desert, Antarctica, and other places. It turned out that these rocks had arrived from the Red Planet. The largest sandcastle in the world is located in Denmark. 30 sand sculptors who created it used more than 5,000 tons of sand. To make it more durable, they added 10% of clay, together with a layer of glue. They built it to stand tall against long and stormy winters. Some photons that don't get absorbed are re-emitted, and their wavelength determines the color we see. When you expose a material to sunlight or photons of higher energy, it can damage its chromophores, which is why they won't be able to emit photons at certain wavelengths. Red materials fade in sunlight the most. Their chromophores emit red light in a way they mop up photons of the rest of the wavelengths. From 60 to 100 tons of space dust drift down to our planet's surface every day. These tiny cosmic particles are mostly released by comets, which are usually made of dust and ice. When the sun turns this ice into vapor, the remaining dust travels down to Earth. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. 
Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over 7 minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 Hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades, but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or, Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of sky quakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, sky quakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. 
the noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. Sing with me. Under the sea, darling, it's better. On where it's drier, take it from me. Okay, okay, I know these are not the correct lyrics to this famous Disney song, but hear me out. The deep sea is not all about singing mermaids and dancing crabs. It's actually filled with monster-like creatures that'll give you nightmares. So, if you're ready to meet them, grab your scuba gear and let's dive into the deep, mysterious waters to discover their fascinating and scary world. With its menacing appearance, one could call this fishy the vampire of the sea. While named for their disproportionately large, razor-sharp fangs protruding from their mouth, fang tooths are actually quite small and harmless to humans. These choppers are actually more for catching prey than causing trouble. So there's no need to panic if you see one. And you'll be even more relieved to know that it's kind of unlikely for you to come across a fang tooth, since they are among the deepest living fish. A regular day in the life of a fang tooth looks like this. By day, they prefer to remain in the gloomy depths. Me too, fishies, me too. It's only towards the evening that they migrate toward the surface to have a feast under starlight. Ah, how romantic! And by daybreak, they return to the deep. What a chill schedule, am I right? So, as you can tell from their daily routine, fangtooths are among the more active deep-sea fishes. And by that I mean they seek out their food rather than just sitting and waiting. And thanks to their oversized teeth and mouth, hey, I can relate, they're able to attack prey that are even larger than themselves, which is very important in the very large, food-poor deep sea. Fitting to their environment, common fangtooths are dark-colored, either solid brown or black. And unlike most deep-sea fishes, they do not have light-producing organs or cells to communicate with each other or to attract their prey. Instead, they rely heavily on their sense of smell, in addition to making use of even the slightest bit of sunlight that makes it down to the depths. This light doesn't help them to see in any way, but it may be enough for potential prey to cast a shadow as they pass overhead, which lets fangtooths know they're around. Now here's one hilarious fun fact before we move on to the next creature. Fangtooths can never close their mouths because of their huge mouths and long teeth. But you know what? I would bet maybe 500 bucks that my orthodontist would claim he could fix that too. Our next horrific deep-sea animal is as real as a kraken can get. Giant squid, which actually did inspire the legends of the kraken, live up to their name. The largest one ever recorded by scientists was almost 59 feet long. It also probably weighed nearly a ton. You would think such a massive animal wouldn't be hard to miss. But since giant squid live deep underwater, they are difficult to come by. Giant squid, along with their cousin, the colossal squid, yep, they are different, have the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're somewhere around 10 inches in diameter. 
In other words, they are around the size of dinner plates. Peekaboo! Having such large eyes allows them to detect objects in the lightless depths of the ocean, where most other animals would see nothing. Not a zippo. Giant squids have eight arms and two long feeding tentacles that help them seize their prey. These tentacles are tipped with hundreds of powerful sharp teeth and are often double the length of their body. This helps them to snatch prey up to 33 feet away. Hey there, come a little closer. Most of what we know about giant squids come from those that floated to the surface and were found by fishermen. After years of research, it was only in 2012 that a group of scientists were able to successfully film a giant squid in its natural habitat for the first time. Yet again, the giant squid continues to remain largely a mystery due to their inhospitable deep-sea habitat. And maybe they're shy. Speaking of squids, this species is basically the space creature of the ocean. So, it's only been about 20 years since the big fin squid family was officially described by scientists. And there are still plenty of facts about them that are yet to be discovered. However, the big fin squid sightings as deep as 20,000 feet below the surface suggest that they can live deeper than any other known squid. You know what? Let's scratch the word space creature and call them the disco dancers of the deep sea to make things a little less scary. Because of their long slender arms, adorned with extravagant rib-like fins, kind of make them look like they're ready to hit the dance floor. Anyway, these boogie arms and tentacles are estimated to max out at just under 30 feet. Aside from the estimations, though, the largest known big fin squid was actually 21 feet long, with 20 feet of that being its arms and tentacles. How exactly a big fin squid uses them is still unknown. But scientists think they like to use them to trap prey that bump into them as they hang down in the water below their body or drag along the seafloor. There are only around a dozen confirmed big fin squid sightings worldwide, so you can just relax. Because the chances of you getting hugged by a big fin squid are close to impossible. But I can't guarantee anything regarding your nightmares. <laughs> now, these are not one of your regular Jaws sharks. Let's start with the most strange fact about a frilled shark. It's considered a living fossil because of its primitive anatomic traits. That actually makes more sense once you learn that this species has been around for 80-some million years. So I have both good news and bad news. Frilled sharks live in the open ocean and spend much of their time in deep, dark waters far below the surface. However, they do feed at the surface of the ocean at night. When hunting food, they move like an eel, bending and lunging to capture their prey. And they can actually swallow it as whole, even if it is larger than their own size. This is all thanks to their long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 recurved needle-like teeth. Okay, I am somewhat freaked out now. Unlike the rest of the deep-sea creatures I've talked about, frilled sharks might sometimes accidentally get caught in nets. So if fishing is your thing, <laughs> beware. This telescope won't help you see the stars and the planets. With its protruding eyes and elongated body, this little swimmer looks like it's wearing a pair of underwater binoculars, hence the name the telescope fish. Found in cold, deep, tropical to subtropical waters worldwide, they're known to be the species that undergoes one of the most drastic transformations in fishes. When the first larva was described in 1954, it was believed to be a new species rather than the larva of a telescope fish that were known to science since 1901. Despite the fact that they are only around 6 to 8 inches long, they're able to latch onto snacks that are bigger than their own size. That is thanks to their massive and highly stretching jaws, making up most of the size of their head. These large prey are then folded in half to fit in their expandable stomach. In 1925, scientists found a 5.5-inch long fish inside the stomach of a 3-inch long telescope fish, which they described as neatly folded. Despite all this, their cylindrical tube-shaped eyes are still the most fascinating and bizarre features of telescope fishes. Their specific shape increases light collection to help them detect their prey's weak bioluminescence even from a distance. But although their eyes are good for seeing things in the twilight, they're especially great at seeing silhouettes from below. 
That's why they orient themselves vertically in the water. Now, I have to admit, they look kind of cute if you ask me. Sort of like uglier versions of minions. Yeah, right? Imagine a world where instead of water, the oceans are made of methane. Yeah, that's right. Instead of swimming in H2O, you'd be paddling around in CH4. It's like Mother Nature's version of a fizzy drink. Such oceans actually exist on one of Saturn's moons called Titan. In fact, the methane and ethane on Titan play a similar role to the water on Earth. They cycle through the atmosphere and form clouds that eventually rain down onto the surface. They were discovered by the Cassini-Huygens space probe. And apparently, our entire planet's oil reserves could fit in one of Titan's puddles. Even the desert sand dunes on Titan have more organics than all of Earth's coal reserves. Who knew that Titan was the place to go if you're ever in need of fuel for your car? Now, obviously, there are some things that distinguish methane lakes from our water ones. First, the temperature on Titan is around negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like taking a dip in a giant glass of liquid nitrogen. Not exactly ideal for a beach day, is it? Methane is also less dense than water. So if you were to go swimming in such an ocean, you'd float like a balloon. On the bright side, it would make doing the backstroke a lot easier. Next, while water waves can be pretty majestic, unfortunately, we can't ride any on Titan. Cassini didn't detect any big waves there. Maybe it's due to low seasonal winds, or the fact that some of the lakes are much smaller than Earth's lakes, but we don't know for sure. Also, I know what you're thinking. If the oceans are made of methane, could you set them on fire? Technically, yes. Methane is a highly flammable gas. So if you were to light a match in a methane ocean, you'd get a pretty impressive but dangerous blaze. So given all these differences, the question arises, what would a planet with such oceans look like? Well, we can make some guesses by looking at Titan. First of all, its atmosphere, composed primarily of methane, would be incredibly thick. Titan's atmosphere reaches nearly 370 miles into space, and the atmospheric pressure there is 60% greater than Earth's. So if you ever wanted to experience the feeling of swimming super deep in the ocean, now's your chance. Also, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas that traps the sun's heat really well. That's why our planet would warm up faster than a sauna. You may ask, why is it so cold on Titan then? This is because this moon is very far from the sun, and light doesn't reach it well. But if we place our planet somewhere in the middle, then the temperature may even be quite comfortable. Actually, methane oceans on a planet could really spice up the climate. The planet would be a breeding ground for methane clouds. Just like on Titan, it could form an orange-colored haze, or smog, that would make our planet look like a real mystery. It would be difficult to see us from space without some special telescopes. And let's not forget about methane storms. They would also occasionally drench the surface, so remember to bring your umbrella. But hey, at least the heavy, carbon-rich compounds would make for some pretty sweet dune fields. And finally, the most important difference. While water oceans on Earth are teeming with all sorts of creatures, we're not sure if there's any life in methane oceans on Titan. If there is, they'd have to be pretty tough to survive in such extreme conditions. So if life on such a planet exists, it would be very different from what we're used to seeing on Earth. For example, microbes might be able to handle it. These tiny resilient creatures can survive in a wide range of environments, including extreme ones. So it's possible that microbial life could exist in methane oceans. And what about us and animals? Well, scientist Robert Zubrin thinks that Titan might be the perfect place for humans to colonize in our solar system. According to him, this little moon has everything we need to survive and thrive. And if it's possible on that moon, then it could work with a planet too. For starters, 
we'd need some oxygen to breathe. We could use nitrogen and methane in the atmosphere to create breathable air and rocket fuel. We could also use these elements to make some fertilizers and grow plants. Next up, we'd need water. Since the oceans are made of methane, we can't exactly drink them. We'd need to find or create sources of water. Scientists believe that it actually may be hidden below the surface on Titan, together with some ammonia. We could use it to drink or create even more oxygen. So with all of these resources, we could create a self-sustaining colony even in a place with methane oceans. Piece of cake. Although there are always alternatives. Maybe we could become methane breathers, evolve into organisms that use methane instead of oxygen. For example, we could get some large lungs because we'd have to inhale a much larger volume of air since methane is less dense than oxygen. But this is pure sci-fi. Methane oceans are not the only unusual oceans in space. It turns out that seas on diamond planets may be even weirder. Take WASP-12b, for example. This exoplanet, located about 1,200 light years away, might have oceans of tar. That's right, tar. The planet has more carbon than oxygen, which means its crust is probably made of things like diamond and graphite, instead of your average silica-based minerals like granite. Imagine stepping on this planet, and the first thing you notice is that the beaches are made up of black goo. It's like stepping into a nightmare, where you're trapped in quicksand made of sticky sludge. So forget about the sandy beaches and crystal clear water you're used to. Here, you'll be living the pitch life. Your swimwear will be replaced with hazmat suits, and you'll need a sturdy pair of boots to walk on the sticky surface. But in reality, WASP-12b is not the place to look for geology of any kind. It's simply too hot for anything to survive, let alone thrive. But there might be smaller, similar exoplanets where we could potentially live. Now, you might be thinking, tar oceans? Eh, that's crazy talk. But did you know that there's a 246-foot deep lake of natural asphalt here on Earth? It's called Pitch Lake, and it's located in Trinidad. It's formed when oil is forced to the surface, and the lighter components evaporate, leaving the thicker, heavier pitch behind. And guess what? This lake is home to a thriving ecosystem of microbes. So if you want to live on such a planet, at least you won't be alone. You'll have plenty of company in bacteria, fungi that love to feast on carbon found in asphalt, and archaea that live on methane. And finally, there are oceans of molten rock. That's right, imagine a world where the floor is lava isn't just a game, but a reality. Welcome to 55 Cancri E, a planet so hot that the entire hemisphere facing its star is covered in magma. It's like a scene out of a heavy metal album cover. But don't worry, the other side of the planet is slightly cooler, so you can at least step off the lava and catch your breath. If you're feeling adventurous, you could always hop over to Koro T7b, another super Earth where the lava ocean is just a scorching. But this time, the night side doesn't offer much respite either. It's still seeing constant volcanic eruptions, like some sort of fireworks show. Scientists are scratching their heads trying to explain why these planets are so hot and why they haven't cooled down yet. Maybe they're just really good at retaining heat, or maybe they just have a bad temperament. Either way, it's probably best to stick to playing the floor is lava on solid ground and leave the real lava planets to someone else. All this diversity of oceans shows us that the universe is always full of surprises. It never ceases to amaze us with its creativity. Although these oceans are not suitable for human exploration, Yet, they challenge our understanding of what could exist beyond our world. So, let's continue. We've heard stories about people surviving in the desert, Amazon forest, and uninhabited islands for weeks. 
Such stories show how tough and resilient people can be. But among these many cases, there is one that can really amaze you. It's the story about a guy who spent three days inside a sunken ship at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. He didn't have oxygen tanks, electricity, communications, or food, but he survived. So it all happened in 2013 on a tugboat that was moving through the Atlantic waters along the coast of Nigeria. That day, early in the morning, there was a small storm. The tug was pulling a vessel with oil tanks. Then, all of a sudden, a huge wave formed. It crashed into the ship and broke the cable. At 4.30 a.m., the tugboat turned upside down. Its entire deck was underwater, and the ship's hull stuck out from the surface. The boat began to sink slowly. The crew of 12 people were trapped, as they all were in their locked rooms. They had closed the doors in their cabins as a precaution, since there were many pirates in those waters. Because of the locked rooms, they couldn't get out. But one of them, Cook Harrison Okina, was in the bathroom during this time. The bathroom turned over. Harrison fell on the ceiling. All the clothes and toilet shelves fell on his head. He was stunned and didn't understand what was happening. When he heard the screams of the other crew members, he realized that the ship was sinking. Harrison struggled to his feet. Holding onto the walls, he slowly went out of the cabin. The water level rose above his head. Harrison took a deep breath. He intuitively, driven by fear, reached the engineering room. There was a small pocket with air. This space wasn't wholly flooded, since the water didn't get there and the air hadn't come out. Harrison realized that this was the safest place for him at that moment. He had no fresh water and no food. He was in a cold, damp room. The floor was flooded, and Harrison's feet began to freeze. There was almost no chance of survival. The man found a soda bottle inside the room and a life jacket with two flashlights attached to it. By this time, the ship had descended to the bottom of the ocean at a depth of 100 feet. This is about the height of a 10-story building. The ship's hull was squeezed and made a grinding noise due to the pressure of the water. Then, Harrison heard a strange movement outside the door. It was sharks and other fish that were investigating the deck. At this point, Harrison began to lose hope. Lack of food supplies and pressure weren't the main problems. The air pocket was small, which meant there was little oxygen. Every 24 hours, an average person consumes about 350 cubic feet of air, which means Harrison had less than one day left to breathe. But despite this, he lived in such conditions for about 60 hours. This happened thanks to the water. The pressure around the ship was so intense that it compressed the air by about four times. Another problem was the cook's breathing. When we inhale, we absorb oxygen. When we exhale, we release carbon dioxide. This substance is dangerous to your health if its concentration in the air is 5%. Harrison slowly filled the room with carbon dioxide, and he couldn't get out. With each hour, it became harder to breathe. But here again, he was lucky. Water absorbs carbon dioxide, and Harrison moved and splashed it in different directions. Thus, unknowingly, he increased the water area and kept the carbon dioxide level below critical. But even here, his dangers were not over. Hypothermia may occur in a dark, cold room. It's a condition when your body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. You get cold, and your perception of the world gets distorted. You don't understand where you are and what's going on. You may lose your memory and even experience terminal burrowing. This weird behavior occurs during hypothermia when a person tries to find a small shelter, even if they're in a closed room. They can even start digging the cold floor with their bare hands. At the same time, a person quickly freezes and loses consciousness within two hours. Harrison's room was filled from below with icy water. He wouldn't have survived in such conditions if he had stayed on the floor for several hours. But he managed to build a small platform with a mattress. This kept him slightly above the water level. With each passing hour, fear and despair more and more bound the survivor's mind. He couldn't get out for many reasons. One of them was that only a little sunlight passes to such a depth, and Harrison couldn't see it. 
The soda bottle was almost empty, and the flashlight stopped working. The man found himself in pitch darkness, but his salvation was close. While rescuers were searching for survivors nearby, he was thinking about his family and life. Harrison noticed rays of light through a hole in the wreckage. Divers were examining the seabed. It was the only chance to survive. Harrison came out of the air pocket and swam towards the rescuers. He was making his way through the darkness. The ray of light coming from the diver's flashlight disappeared. Harrison tried blindly to find the diver, but they were at the other end of the deck. His oxygen was running out, so Harrison decided to return. There was almost no air left in his lungs. He began to suffocate, but still got to the rescue room. The main thing was not to despair. It was his only chance for salvation. After catching his breath and replenishing the oxygen supply in his lungs, Harrison made a second attempt. He got out of the room and noticed the diver. He swam towards them with all of his might. The lifeguard didn't see Harrison, so the cook knocked on his neck from behind and grabbed his hand tightly. The diver was initially scared, but he realized a living person was in front of him. Harrison swam to his room and led the lifeguard as his oxygen ran out. You can easily find a recording from the diver's camera on the internet, where the frightened Harrison was in his rescue room during a meeting with the diver. The rescuers gave him an oxygen mask. They didn't believe there was a living person in front of them. Harrison couldn't immediately get to the surface because of the pressure. He spent about 60 hours on the seabed, so he needed to change the pressure level slowly to prevent damage to his health. Therefore, the divers put him in a decompression chamber to gradually reduce the external pressure. Then, when Harrison got out, he saw the stars. The cook thought that he had been at the bottom of the ocean all day. So he was surprised when he found out that he had been underwater for 60 hours. Also, he thought that all the crew members had forgotten about him and left the ship at the beginning. Many years have passed since then, but Harrison still has nightmares about his air room. Sometimes he wakes up in the middle of the night and tells his wife that the bed is sinking and they're now at sea. A similar case occurred in 1991 with scuba diver Michael Proudfoot. He was studying a sunken submarine off the coast of Baja, California. During this dive, he accidentally broke his breathing regulator and deprived himself of oxygen reserves. Michael couldn't get to the surface because he was too deep. He wouldn't have had enough air in his lungs. Fortunately, the diver found an air pocket inside the ship. He swam there and waited for rescuers. For two days, he was underwater in complete darkness. He ate raw sea urchins and drank a small amount of warm water from a found pot. Fortunately, rescuers found him. Michael Proudfoot got out of the trap and stayed alive. In 1945, five TBF Avenger aircraft took flight for a routine training exercise around the Bermuda Triangle. In the middle of the exercise, the planes were struck by intense rain and heavy winds, despite the clear weather forecast. The pilots became extremely disoriented and radioed the base to report that their navigational equipment had stopped working. The last thing the base heard was, when the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll all go down together, and then static. The five planes and their 14 crew members were never seen or heard from again. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night, when he was on the deck of the ship, he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. You might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for the many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. 
Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. No one knows exactly how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. Another bizarre theory trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charlie Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. In the year 1800, a large sailing vessel called the USS Pickering departed from the U.S. on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew and was never heard from again. The USS Pickering was the first-ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle. It's believed that the ship was taken out by a storm, but because no wreckage was ever found, we'll never know for sure. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. No trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. An enormous investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. This particular area of the ocean is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. On the ocean floor, decomposing organisms let off large concentrations of methane gas that gets trapped under the water. This gas can build up until, boom, it ruptures. The gas surges up to the surface and erupts. If a ship was in the area of one of these ruptures, the water would become much less dense and cause the ship to sink rapidly and without warning. Scientists believe this could be the cause of the many disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. While this theory makes a lot of sense, it doesn't seem too likely. The U.S. Geological Survey has stated that no large releases of gas are believed to have occurred in this area for the past 15,000 years. The ocean floor is made of rocks containing a lot of magnetite. It's more like iron. Magnetic fields react to high concentrations of magnetite on the ocean floor, which may start a sort of conflict between the two. It can often lead to various weather anomalies and, as a result, navigation issues. And, naturally, any changes in the ocean floor or the Earth's magnetic fields influence the Bermuda Triangle a lot. Since the magnetic field is constantly moving, it might be also taking the Bermuda Triangle with it. Now that people know where the triangle is, it's easy to avoid it. It supposedly moves eastward together with the magnetic poles. But scientists still can't answer where exactly it will be in a couple of years. Some people blame all the disasters on the extraterrestrial paranormal activity. Others suppose it's all about raging natural phenomena. There's another triangle in Lake Michigan. Just like the one near Bermuda, the Michigan Triangle got its shady reputation for some disappearances. The first recorded one dates back to 1679. A large vessel, one of the largest of that time, set out on an expedition. Yet, once it got in the sinister triangle, it never came back. Much later, an aircraft disappeared in this triangle. The skies are usually very clear there, but back in 1883, some people witnessed abnormal things in the area. Some claim to have seen large blocks of ice falling from the skies, and the crew even managed to save one as hard proof. Meanwhile, the Pacific Ocean mystery area is another sinister triangle. Off the south coast of Japan, not far away from Tokyo, 
there's a sea where plenty of ships met their doom, disappearing without a trace in these waters. They call it the Devil's Triangle. Some scientists believe the cause of anomalies is the environmental changes. Also, there's a really high concentration of methane hydrates on the bottom of the ocean in the Pacific Triangle area. You're deviating from your original course and sailing in the wrong direction. There's the Caribbean Sea near the Triangle, peppered with small islands. The seafloor here isn't deep. The ship can get in shallow waters. And now the ship is stuck on a shoal, and you have no idea where you are. If this were the 21st century, the ship's captain would be able to reach the shore using GPS and other modern navigation. But the most interesting thing is that the compass would work correctly this time, since the magnetic North Pole hasn't already coincided with the true one for a long time in the territory of the Bermuda Triangle. The Agonic Line is somewhere far away from here. There are no problems with navigation now, but for some reason, this is where ships disappear. In fact, not just here. Throughout the Atlantic Ocean, there are places where many more ships were gone. The Bermuda Triangle is not even in the top 10 of such places. One of the main reasons why many ships are lost here is that one of the most popular shipping routes in the Atlantic passes through the Bermuda Triangle. And the more ships in one place, the more shipwrecks. Simple probability. Then, it just starts getting weird. Other theories say that there's a space-time rift in this region. Ships and planes fall into this rift and end up in the past or the future. But for some reason, there's not a single proof of this myth. There's no reason to think that the rift is hidden somewhere here. The base of an extraterrestrial civilization is located in the Bermuda Triangle. Visitors from other galaxies steal sea vessels along with the crew, so no one finds the wreckage of the ships. This is also a popular myth that has no scientific justification. The Kraken lives somewhere in the Triangle. It's a huge squid that sinks ships and also is a legend that sailors tell each other. However, gigantic squids live in the depths of the ocean. They can grow to the size of a half a train car, but no cases have ever been recorded where they sunk a large vessel. And in the area of the Bermuda Triangle, they have never ever been seen. People in the past didn't know about the existence of these creatures. So when they saw them for the first time, they described them as huge, terrible monsters. Giant squids are some of the most elusive creatures on Earth, and scientists had to use sonar equipment to find them. They don't like to leave the dark depths and are likely to be afraid of the sound of any ship. So that should squash the squid as a suspect. Thick fog is rising over the ocean as the sun is slowly sinking towards the horizon. It's hard to see further away than a few dozen feet, but that's enough to notice a hulking, skeletal shape in the distance. As your ship approaches the figure, your heart beats faster, and then you make out the details of another vessel, abandoned by the looks of it. Ghost ships do exist, and their mysteries aren't always solved. Take MV Hoyita, for example. It was a wooden vessel built in 1931 as a luxury yacht. It had served well to various people over 20 years before it was bought by a Samoan sailor and became a merchant ship. In 1955, though, Hoyita's service came to an abrupt and mysterious end. On October 3rd, it set sail for another trading voyage that should have taken no more than 48 hours. Delays happen in the sea, so when Hoyita didn't arrive on October 5th as scheduled, there was little worry yet, but then it failed to come on the following day too. There was no distress signal or any other sign of Hoyita's presence anywhere between its departure and arrival points. A search and rescue party was dispatched to find the ship, and for six days, they were scouting the area of nearly 100,000 square miles. On October 12th, the mission returned to the base empty-handed. Hoyita vanished without a trace. It was only a month later that another merchant ship, Tuvalu, noticed the missing vessel far away from its route, drifting in the open sea and listing heavily. The sailors boarded the ship and found that all of its crew and passengers, 25 people total, were missing along with all the cargo the vessel had been carrying. The radio was tuned to the International Distress Channel, meaning that the crew had been trying to ask for help, but they couldn't reach anyone because the radio cable had been damaged. 
limiting the range to two miles. The lifeboats were missing as well, indicating that people on board must have left the ship. Unfortunately, they seem to have taken the logbook with them, leaving the rescue team clueless as to what had happened. Even today, the mystery of MV Hoyita hasn't been solved yet. No one knows where the crew and passengers had gone and what had caused them to leave. SV Carol A. Deering wasn't a ghost ship in the usual sense of the word. There are no sightings of it in the open sea. Instead, it was found on the shore. But the circumstances of it running aground are a puzzle shrouded in mystery. Carol A. Deering was built in 1919 in Maine, and it was a large vessel made for commercial voyages. Unfortunately, despite its large cost of construction, it had only served for a year before its last trip. July 19, 1920. The ship was traveling from Puerto Rico to Rio de Janeiro via Newport News to deliver a cargo of coal. It was almost halfway to the final destination when the captain felt seriously ill, and the crew turned back to drop him and his son off and replace the captain. The voyage went without incident, but when it came to Barbados in December to resupply, there were strange moods among the crew. The first mate didn't seem to be happy with the new captain. No one paid much attention to it back then, when they probably should have. The last sighting of Carol A. Deering at sea was on January 28, 1921, when a lightship noticed it off the coast of North Carolina. There was some commotion on the quarter deck of the ship, where the crew were normally not allowed. Then, another vessel sighted it, but there was already no one on the decks. On January 31st, the merchant ship was found hard aground in the Diamond Shoals, a site notorious for numerous shipwrecks that had been occupying there for centuries. When the search and rescue party boarded the ship, they found it abandoned, the log and personal belongings of the crew gone, along with the two lifeboats. There is still no answer to what happened on board of Carol A. Deering that January, although the most popular version was mutiny. Maybe we'll never find out the truth, though. SS Bechimo is perhaps one of the most notable ghost ships in history. This large cargo steamer was built in 1914 in Sweden and plotted its way dutifully over 16 years, trading provisions for pelts with native tribes of Alaska and Canada. But then, on October 1st, 1931, Bechimo got caught in pack ice. At first, it seemed the crew would be able to wait it out and continue on their route because the ship broke free in a couple of days. But in less than a week, it became caught again, this time for good. In another week, a rescue party was sent to fetch 22 of the Bechismo's crew, while another 15 remained behind to wait through the winter if necessary and get the ship back. But a month later, after a powerful blizzard struck their camp, the sailors went out of their shelters only to find the ship gone. Luckily, a few days later, a native hunter told the Bechimo hadn't been lost yet. He'd seen it about 45 miles from where they had been stationed. They managed to track it down, but decided the ship wouldn't survive the winter. So they took the most valuable cargo from its hold and abandoned it. They were wrong though, SS Bechimo did survive that winter and many more that followed. When the ice broke, it sailed away on its own, drifting listlessly along the shores of Canada and Alaska. There were numerous sightings of the ghost ship, sometimes adrift in the open sea, and at other times, stuck in the pack ice again. People attempted to board and salvage it, but weather conditions or lack of equipment always prevented them. SS Bechimo was last sighted by Native Alaskans in 1969, 38 years after its abandonment. What became of it later remains unknown. The story of SS Orang Maidan is one of the most puzzling and harrowing ghost ship stories of the 20th century. No one even knows for sure if the ship even existed in the first place. It wasn't recorded in Lloyd's Shipping, the International Register of Ships, which makes it either a tall tale or a vessel that avoided being officially recognized for some shady reasons. In any case, the accounts as to what happened to the Maidan vary. According to most reports, it was carrying some unknown cargo in the Indonesian waters when a distress call was received by another ship in the vicinity. The officer on duty heard an SOS message, but its contents are different depending on the accounts. 
The message did not repeat, and the crew of Maidan didn't answer to any attempts to contact it back. The ship that received the distress call hurried to the rescue, but they only reached the vessel the following day, when it was already drifting and slightly listing. When the rescuers boarded the ship, they found that none of the crew had survived. However, one lifeboat was missing, which implied that there was at least one crew member who managed to escape. What happened to the rest of the people on board remains a mystery to this day. Still, there are no hard facts about this story, so we might never find out whether SS Orang Maidan was actually a ship and not a thing of fiction. SV Zabrina was a three-mast sailing barge built in 1873 for river trade ships in South America. She served for well over four decades, proving to be a sturdy and reliable ship. It was later transferred to Europe, where it continued serving its purpose well. But then, in October 1917, Zabrina set sail on a regular voyage only to be found ashore several days later. Mysteriously, although the ship was perfectly intact, the entire crew of five and the captain were gone. There is no direct evidence or hard facts as to what really happened that day. The most convincing theory is that the crew were washed away from the deck because of an underwater explosion. And then the ship sailed ahead without them. But the truth, as always, remains unknown. It's 2010. You're in the Japanese waters of the Pacific Ocean, about 745 miles south of Tokyo and very close to the island of Iwo Jima. The sky is clear. There are almost no waves. A heavy, low rumble comes from somewhere deep under the sea. It scares away all the flying gulls. And then it gets quiet. Too quiet. It seems that even light waves don't dare to make a sound. Suddenly, a small bubble rises to the surface of the water. Then, thousands of air bubbles start moving up one after another. The water begins to boil and heat up. Its temperature is so high that you can cook eggs or pasta in here. The boiling area grows to the size of a stadium. A huge amount of steam is released into the air. You can see an outline of some huge object through the boiling water. Then, everything stops. The water cools. The amount of bubbles goes down, and the surface of the ocean becomes calm again. That year, an underwater volcano erupted at that specific location. Fortunately, it didn't bring any serious consequences. In August 2021, the eruption repeated. But this time, everything wasn't limited to the bubbling water. The Japanese Coast Guard reported strong volcanic activity in the region. Hot steam and gases came out of the water and rose into the air to a height of 10 miles, which is about twice the height of Mount Everest. The huge awakened volcano began to slowly lift to the surface. If you took a helicopter ride above this place, you'd see more and more land coming out of the water. This is not just a volcano, it's a whole island in the shape of a horseshoe. And this is just the beginning. Seismologists say this island is the tip of a huge volcano. It fills the sky with smoke and ash. The air temperature is rising. Scientists continue to monitor the situation. They believe the volcano can completely get out of the water. Nobody knows what consequences this may have. This isn't the first island that has appeared in the waters of Japan. Underwater volcanoes have erupted several times over the past century. One of the most surprising cases occurred in 2013. That year, a small piece of land was formed next to the already existing island. The underwater volcano that emerged from the water began to grow slowly. At some moment, it connected to the island. After two years, the area of this island increased by 12 times compared to the original size. Smoke is always pouring out of this place, and its surface is filled with red-hot lava flows. The volcano is unstable and isn't going to calm down. Such phenomena occur not only off the coast of Japan. In the 1960s, a volcano awoke on the southern coast of Iceland. For three whole years, it was coming to the surface and had formed an island by 1967. They called it Tsertsi. Unlike the Japanese islands, this is where the volcanic eruptions ended. Now the island is one of the most inaccessible places on the planet. Only a few scientists in the world have permission to walk around this place. They want to learn how the plant and animal life of the island are formed without human intervention. 
This is a unique event, and here's why. Underwater volcanoes differ in their behavior from land volcanoes. They don't explode and don't release lava flows upwards. A huge amount of water above them creates high pressure. As soon as the magma gets out, the water immediately lowers it to the seafloor. Underwater eruptions don't normally cause any changes on the ocean surface. So, millions of gallons of lava sink to the bottom, cool down, and solidify around the volcano. This lava forms a thick layer of Earth's rock. To make an island appear on the surface, an underwater volcano needs a lot of magma. The next eruption creates another thick layer. Millions of years pass, and passive lava flows form mountains. Constant eruptions increase the height of the seabed. Layer by layer, the cooled lava rises higher and higher. And then, one day, it appears on the surface in the form of an island. Often, underwater volcanoes don't reach the surface and fall asleep forever. Such volcanoes are called seamounts. The tectonic activity also affects the formation of islands. The volcano has a source of magma that comes from the mantle of the planet. The tectonic plate is moving, and a volcano is placed on it. So the plate can lead the volcano away from the source of magma. When a volcano rises, it can simply move aside and no longer erupt. From the outside, the volcanic islands look like an apocalypse. Lava spraying in different directions, smog and ash filling the sky. But in fact, volcanoes are not about destruction, but the creation of new life. Lava is any hot metal, but the natural lava flowing out of volcanoes is called magma. When it appears on the surface of the ground, various gases and acids instantly evaporate from it, and magma becomes lava. But underground, it's magma. These molten metals contain trace elements of almost all chemical substances that exist in nature. They enrich the land they're flowing in. Ash is also filled with many different elements. The lava hardens, the ash settles, and this creates favorable conditions for the appearance of a rich ecosystem. It can take millions of years to develop, though. The simplest bacteria appear. They feed on chemical elements coming from the volcano. When you have favorable conditions for bacteria, you get favorable conditions for bigger life forms. Birds flying by also help to develop the new ecosystem. They build nests on the island, bring tree seeds, and plant spores from the continents and other islands. All this enriches life on the volcano. Volcanoes are isolated places, so unique species of animals, insects, and bacteria can appear only there and can't be found anywhere else on the planet. However, if the volcano wakes up, it can also destroy the ecosystem. The entire island can be covered with ash and simply lose all vegetation. But then, on the scorched ground, life can appear again. Hundreds of islands around the world appeared because of the eruptions of underwater volcanoes. Hawaii, Indonesia, and Iceland have them on their territory. Imagine that people settled on a similar volcanic island and built a city there. And one day, the volcano woke up. It once happened, 200 miles south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful town right in the center of an active volcano on the island of Aogashima. In May 1785, the catastrophe began. That day was sunny, and no one could imagine what tragedy was approaching them. At some point, thousands of birds took to the air and flew away from the island. Then, the ground began to shake. A heavy, low sound came out of the town depths. Streams of smoke were coming out of the crater of a green volcano. The volcano was throwing dirt, large stones, and various debris into the sky. The disaster lasted for several weeks. Since then, more than 200 years have passed, and the volcano has never woken up again. The town was rebuilt after the disaster. Now, this place is so great, people don't want to leave, despite the risk of a new eruption. More and more residents are coming to the island. There are many thermal springs, and the waters around the island are rich in fish. But the volcano may wake up at any moment. Fortunately, meteorological and seismological services monitor the situation. A lake can also form inside the volcano, but you shouldn't swim in it. In Indonesia, on the island of Java, there's a volcano with a crater inside. It's filled with turquoise water. The magma inside the volcano consists of many molten metals and chemical compounds, and the lake gets these substances. 
the volcano emits sulfur dioxide gases that combine with the metallic lake. This gives the water its strong acidity and turquoise color. The steam coming from the lake is acid. When it combines with air, it ignites. This is visible at night. Sulfur accumulations flare up and illuminate everything around. The Easter Island giant heads are so popular that they even have their own emoji. Their true meaning has been a mystery for hundreds of years. But it looks like we at least know how they were built and transported to their permanent location. The Moai statues consist of three parts. A large yellow body, a red hat or top knot, and white inset eyes with a coral iris. Around 1,000 of them were created. The main bodies of most of the statues were made out of volcanic tuff from a local quarry in what used to be a volcano. The material is easy to carve, but not so easy to transport. That's probably why researchers found over 300 unfinished moai back in the quarry. The rest of them stand in various locations, facing the villages as if watching over the locals. So, it looks like the statues were carved lying on their backs. Then, their creators detached them from the rock, moved them down slope, and set them in a vertical position to finish the work. Once it was done, it was time to get the statue to its platform. Now, if you've ever moved houses, you know how physically hard it is. So, imagine having to move a statue that is about half as heavy as a house without a car or any modern equipment for a distance of three miles. The locals must have invented some original way of doing it, and scientists tried to recreate it to guess what it was. They tried pulling Moai replicas on wooden sleds. They thought someone could have used palm trees for that purpose, but this theory has been debunked. The most successful experiment so far was wielding ropes to rock the statue down the road in a standing position. This method sounds real because the local Rapa Noai legends mention that the Moai walked from the quarry. And, of course, they needed a good road to get there. In the early 20th century, researcher Catherine Rutledge identified an 800-year-old road network on the island. It was a bunch of pathways around 15 feet wide going from the quarry. She thought that those roads were ceremonial and not built just for the statues. She wasn't a famous scientist back then, so others mostly ignored the theory. Several decades later, famous Norwegian adventurer and archaeologist Thor Heyerdahl published his theory. He mentioned that the roads were built exclusively to transport the Moai and some of the statues were dropped along the roads for some reason. But in 2010, researchers found that the statues weren't randomly dropped. They actually reached their final destinations as they were all set on hidden platforms. Plus, the road floor was U-shaped, so pulling massive statues along them wouldn't be easy. You can still find roughly 15.5 miles of these roads on the island and see them from satellite images. And it looks like Catherine Rutledge was right about them. The roads were probably built for pilgrims to a sacred volcano, and the Moai standing by them were sort of signposts. Halfway across the world in southern England lies another mystery made of stone, a massive sound illusion, a symbol of unity, a burial ground, or more. Scientists are still debating the purpose of Stonehenge. It took Neolithic builders around 1,500 years to construct this beauty made of roughly 100 stones standing upright in a circle. Millions of tourists come to see it every year, and heritage protectors were worried about the modern road snaking close to the landmark. That modern road is now sunk into the ground below the grass level. And even though archaeologists assumed they could find an older road under it, they didn't have any high hopes. But when they took off a layer of asphalt, they noticed two parallel ditches that were nearly perpendicular to the road. The ditches connected the shortened sections of the avenue, 
That's what the archaeologists call the ancient pathway leading up to Stonehenge. It proves that the ancient people used to visit the monument for their purposes and probably some ceremonies. Another interesting find during a dry summer was three dry patch marks within the stone circle. It looks like they were left there by three massive boulders. So Stonehenge could have been a full circle once. In 2021, archaeologists found a Roman road submerged in the Venetian lagoon. The fact that it runs there on the bottom for nearly 4,000 feet is proof that the Romans were here before sea levels rose and flooded the area. It supports the theory that there was an important settlement here centuries before Venice was founded at the spot in the 5th century CE. The ancient Romans were great at many things, and one of them was building roads. And it looks like they weren't afraid to work on the trickiest terrain. Scans have shown that the ancient road was built right on the beach, and it requires some serious skills. Imagine a village from over a thousand years ago frozen in time. There's still half-eaten food on the tables and personal things left in a rush. It's all preserved so well because it's covered by volcanic ash. Researchers found this village in 2011 in modern-day El Salvador. They believe there was a mass celebration in a Maya village called Seren over 1400 years ago. The whole village was there, preparing the main temple for a ritual when a nearby volcano erupted. The 200-plus residents had no time to rush back to their homes. To save their lives, they had to flee the plaza and run south on a raised road called Sakbe. They managed to escape from the plumes of volcanic ash. In addition to being a superhero and saving all the people, the road had another cool feature. All Sakbe roads had an outer layer of stones. But this one was made of ash. Ironic, isn't it? It proves that the Maya people didn't only use stones to build their roads. Archaeologists discovered several coins in Jerusalem when they were excavating an old street. When they saw the minting dates, they realized the road was built when Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. Since he was the local ruler, it's almost clear that he gave the order to build the road. The pilgrims most likely used this road to reach the Temple Mount for worship. The pathway, which was laid with over 10,000 tons of limestone, was almost as broad as a London bus is long. It had been there for 2,000 years. It's not common that you find such a luxurious road, and it's not clear why a Roman governor would spend so much money on the road. It was probably his attempt to make the city's population like him. Plus, it was a great way to show he had both money and influence. The Old North Trail is an ancient highway that the inhabitants of North America used for 10,000 years. First on foot, then with dogs, and finally with horses. The first travelers moved around the continent down its paths for thousands of miles long before the first Europeans arrived, and even during the last ice age. They used it to carry trade goods, visit relatives, find a mate, or just explore. Researchers keep finding evidence that the stories and legends of the Blackfoot Indians about this trail are real. And it could be even the road that served one of the most massive human migrations, the people who crossed from Asia on the Bering Land Bridge about 15,000 years ago and settled in North America might have used the ice-free corridor along the Rockies, which later became a part of the trail. The Nakasendo Highway was built in the 17th century during the Edo period of Japanese history to link Kyoto and Tokyo. The 310-mile-long road runs across mountain ranges and down onto the plain. It was one of the five main roads used by the feudal lords and their families to travel to the capital. There were 69 post stations on the route where travelers could stay overnight. The road was built for horses and pedestrians, as the Japanese didn't use carts. You can still walk parts of the route.
You're flying over the Pacific Ocean when suddenly a storm hits the plane, causing it to shake. The aircraft begins to descend and you lose control. You quickly put on a parachute, eject yourself from the plane and land on an island. It's a good thing you were the only one on the plane transporting some goods overseas. Luckily enough, the storm hasn't damaged your parachute. You unstrap yourself and head to the closest shelter under some palm trees. You're waiting for the storm to be over. The next day. The sun is shining and the waves seem nice and friendly. You wake up and look around. Nothing but a large stretch of water encircling you from all directions. Not a boat, human or another living being is around. You scout the island, trying to find anything. You don't even know what you're looking for. On one side of the small island, you see some scrap metal and remnants of the plane washed ashore. You rush over there and try to see if there's anything useful. Too bad everything is destroyed. However, one sealed box has made it. You open it and see dozens of duct tape rolls piled on top of each other. After going through the island, you head back to your camp, dragging the box of duct tape. You try to figure out what to do. Soon, you get a light bulb moment. There are some places on the island that are hard to access, and since your shoes have been damaged, you fashion out some sandals. To do it, you grab some branches and try to use duct tape to make a new pair of shoes. After many failed attempts, you almost give up. But then, you attach some duct tape to pieces of tree bark that are roughly the size of your foot. Those are going to be the soles of your new shoes. The duct tape is smooth and won't hurt your feet. After adding several branches, you wrap the duct tape around your feet and voila! You have duct tape sandals. Now you can venture into the rocky parts of the island without damaging your feet. As you walk along the island, you start feeling the heat. You wrap your shirt around your head, but it's not enough to protect you. You use some duct tape to create a hat with the help of leaves. Then you place it on your head. You're now safe to go. After a while, you bring back some stuff you found around the island. By this time, you've started to feel that your tummy is rumbling. Next, at a rocky reef, you spot some large yummy crabs and fish, but you can't catch them with your bare hands. You grab a long branch, take some palm tree leaves, and tie everything together to make a net. You then use the duct tape to reinforce it and head to the reef. You're wearing your makeshift sandals and the hat to protect your head and carrying the net to catch some fish. So far, you've only used two rolls of duct tape. After a while, you manage to catch some fish and crabs and take them back to the camp. You make a fire and start grilling your catch. You're sitting on a log, but such a seat isn't too comfortable. You take some duct tape and make a mat for yourself. Once the food is ready, you feast on it. Now another problem, water. There's no fresh water around, but a storm is coming. Meanwhile, you take some coconuts and eat dessert while drinking coconut milk to freshen up. You prepare a small hut by gathering branches and leaves and duct taping them together so that water can't seep into your new home. At the same time, you create a funnel out of duct tape to collect rainwater. After getting into the funnel, the water is collected in a makeshift pond, also made out of duct tape. At this point, you've used almost half of the duct tape rolls. The storm starts brewing and you stay inside your hut where you have your new floor mat. You're bored, so you create a chair and table out of duct tape to make the hut a little comfier. It starts raining and you notice that some water has gathered in the reservoir you built. You immediately drink it using a coconut shell as a glass. Your hut manages to withstand the storm and you catch some Z's on your comfy mat. The next day, you check the duct tape supply and see that you are now halfway to finishing your last roll of tape. You've made a secured and solid hut 
and have a steady food supply from the reef. You've already spent five days on the island, so now it's time to find a way out. You've tried your best to seek help, but nothing. Not a plane or ship in sight. You're desperate to get out, and you're lucky! You spot a cargo ship very far off in the distance. You need to act quickly. After reviewing your box of duct tape, you decide to create a raft to sail away. You gather enough food and water for the journey and get to work. You start by collecting large logs for a base and setting them side by side. You have some rope made from tree bark and leaves to tie the logs together. It's big enough to fit you. You then get another set of logs and place them on top of the base and repeat the same process to create a second layer. This way, you minimize the risk of sinking. In the end, you duct tape all weak spots to reinforce your raft. You use some branches to create oars for rowing with paddles made out of duct tape. You see that you've used around 75% of your supply, including the tape you use to construct the hut and furniture. It's not as strong as fresh duct tape, but it still does the job. After the base and oars are finished, you create a small hut to shelter your food and supplies and protect them from waves. Also, you make a mast out of wood and use a piece of cloth as a sail. You put the raft on the water and begin rowing. So far so good. You open the sail and take a break from rowing. You turn around and take a look at the island that has been your home for the past five days. You're going on a dangerous journey, risking it all. But if you remain on the island for too long, then you definitely won't make it. It's been an hour already, and the island is barely visible. But the ship is getting closer. You still have one more roll of duct tape to use in emergency situations. The waters are calm, and you see dolphins swimming around. You snack on some fish and drink some water before noticing that the waves have gotten larger. You prepare your sail and duck for cover. It's a good thing your raft is sturdy. Large waves crash against it, knocking off some of your food and water. But the raft is still in one piece. As time passes, the sun begins to set and there's still no sign of life. You use the rest of the duct tape to repair the raft. Even though you lost some food during the storm, you have your net to catch more fish. You start a small and safe bonfire in a coconut shell, cook the fish, and start eating. You turn around and spot a ship coming your way. You immediately grab a branch, light it, and start waving it for the ship to see you. It looks like it will miss you. But then, someone on the ship notices you. They drop down an emergency boat to pick you up and rescue you.